Dog of the Fat Man Beyond. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm Mark Bernardi. Hey! Hello! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fucking Petri dish that is the Scum and Villainy Cantina, man, which is on Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood, California. Put your hands together so the folks at home know you were real when the entire population's dead. Where were you at the end of days? You were here. That's true. We ended our lives in a fucking bar. Um, <laughs> Where it began. Exactly. Enough. So true. The, uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We are in the intrepid few who are still willing to brave the world and go out there and stuff like that. I was uh, going to be in South by Southwest next week, but mm -hmm. they canceled that event. Not so much? Yeah, it's not going to happen. So it's uh, delightful that we're actually, there's some place that's not canceling events yet and stuff. Cut to next week, like fucking hot zone is <laughs> scum and villainy cantina. Yeah. Fucking 50 cases reported. Someone's recruiting Snake Plissken to come in and get us. <laughs> Nobody else will go in. They got that going on right now in New York, in like New Rochelle. They quarantine an entire section where there's a bunch of cases and whatnot, and they're not letting people interact. That shit is like the blob, son. Yeah. Like. <laughs> it is. It, very right now, we're living in like a sci-fi movie and shit like that. Never mind like watching Contagion. Have you gave that a spun recently? Uh, no, because I don't hate myself that much. <laughs> that was the first thing I thought of, though, whenever they started talking about this. I was like, that sounds like that Contagion movie. And then all of a sudden, it was like the number one movie on <laughs> iTunes and shit. I'm like, we all have the same thought. Um, but right now, all still above ground and stuff like that. And uh, just for fucking straw poll, anybody in the room carrying the virus right now? Cover your mouth. <laughs> wash your hands. Yeah, wash your hands. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Again, the worst part is that there's going to be, when it's all said and done, like, motherfuckers are going to stop washing their hands. Because it's like, it's cured. I don't need to do this five yeah. times a day anymore. I don't even need to use the three shells. I can just wipe my ass with my hands. Fuck it. I've seen so many instructional videos that actually, like, taught me a thing or fucking two. And there was one where the people were like, this is how people wash their hands. We're gonna show you how badly they wash their hands by washing our hands with paint. <laughs> and so they wash their hands with paint and just did what essentially I've done my whole life, which is like, and then done. And the hand was like, there was paint here and the rest of it was all uncovered. And it was like, holy shit, that's horrifying. So now I've been like really like washing my hands and singing happy birthday twice and shit. <laughs> Well, I mean, dude, you could do the, the, the litany of fear from Dune. That also times out. Shall not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is a little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear, allow it to pass over me and through me, and when it is gone, only I shall remain. Hands are clean. <laughs> That's awesome. The only problem is I would have to fucking learn that. <laughs> Happy birthday is <laughs> it's already there. right there, yeah. I I go, mean, I, when I'm washing my hands, I'm like, fuck them all. I'm going to do Silent Bob. Uh, speaking of which, I just got back done uh, not too long ago. Finished uh, 65 City Tour, uh, Jay Silent Bob Reboot Roadshow Tour. Yes. What a fucking beast. It's crazy, man. I saw some rock star had announced a fucking tour like a month ago. They're like, we're doing 30 dates. I was like, pussy. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I was there for every one of them, and I think Jamie was there for 59 of them. How many did you go to? 20. 20 of 65. My wow. God, man. And one of you got paid for that. I know. <laughs> I had to be there. What was your fucking excuse? <laughs> um, it was wonderful, and I will miss it every fucking day of my life. And it's nice to be home. It's nice to be here and stuff. But it was just, you know, I said it many times on the road, and Jamie heard it many fucking times during the intro. It was like going to church, to a church every night where I was both the priest and Jesus at the same time. <laughs> oh, it was fucking fantastic, man. And we just drove like every day for five, six hours. It was real punk rock, man. It was like in an SUV and stuff. And every night went to a place where like a thousand people were, were so happy to see us and watch the movie and shit. It was really, really fucking delightful. And um, I, I'm, you know, I was bummed when it ended. Um, it inspired the fuck out of me. We're in as much as like, now I know that's how I want to do Clerks 3, like, I want to pay for the whole fucking thing myself and then take it out on tour and just live on the road with it for, like, a year, man. Like, because I did four months and it was nothing. Uh, like, it, time went by so quickly. Um, and we made so much money. If, uh, <laughs> if we did that for, like, a year, oh, my God. And all that money would be mine. So, like, now I'm like, 
That's the dream. And it's also kind of fucking punk rock to be like, I this started my career. This is how you tell me you want a divorce? Yeah, yeah. We're, good. we're done. <laughs> we're on the road for a year. And then two years. You, you I'm, but I would do it differently this time. Like, I would build in. We'd be on the road for like four weeks and then a week down. Four weeks and a week down. So, like, I'd be able to come back and stuff. But, oh, my God. The, for the guy who started his career, like, very DIY, like, I'm going to make this shit myself. To like finish that trilogy and make that movie myself and then like schlep it, that was my dream with Clerks. Like that's what I thought I was gonna have to do. I'd finance the movie on credit cards and then I'd have to four wall it, rent theaters and fucking convince people to come see it and shit. And then mercifully it went another way. But now I'm like, oh my God, it's my destiny to do it. Like I was always meant to do it. Now, that being said, I'm glad I'm not doing it right the fuck now, <laughs> man. Because every day I thank God we just finished the reboot tour just as the whole world was like, and we're about to hibernate for a year straight. Because <laughs> it's going to be tough to get people to go out for a mm. little while, man. Um, so it, it was a fantastic fucking tour. Uh, that's why I'm not really scared of the coronavirus. Obviously, I'm not in one of the high-risk groups and stuff. But I just spent, like, I, for the last four months, I've been in 65 cities, three countries, um, so more than the 65 cities, 60... 67 fucking cities, three countries, during which time, like, I saw tons of fucking people every night, including, like, we did pictures after the screening, hugging fucking people, taking pictures, hugging them again, and off they went. So I interact, and Jason Mewes is, like, a massive germaphobe, and he was just like, don't touch me. Because um, I was always, like, hugging everybody and shit. And he was like, when are you going to get your jacket dry cleaned? <laughs> And I was like, why? And he's like, you touching everybody, all those germs and shit like that. It never fucking occurred to me once. I didn't even get a fucking cold on the road, nor did I get the flu and shit. So I think my, my um, immune system is functioning like really high right now. And the hidden gift of that tour was I think it probably fucking strengthened it. Because that's me like interacting with a bunch of germs, man. Like whether people intended, I don't give a fuck if they were washing their hair super good or not. That's a lot of fucking bodies to come in contact with. And so far, I haven't been felled by anything. So I'm ready to fucking go right into that hot zone and help motherfuckers, man. I don't think I can catch it. The only thing left for you now is to be dipped in the grotto at the Playboy Mansion like fucking Achilles by your heel. Yes. Like, because if you're looking for the pit of germs that kill motherfuckers, so much shit is in that grotto. I believe that's where they're looking for the virus cure. They're trying to formulate the inoculation from the pool, the old grotto Jimmy pool. Jimmy Kahn's still got semen in here. If we get it back out. Do you think they're going to find the cure what? in semen? I don't think you understand the coronavirus, Mark. I don't think you understand Sonny, Sonny Corleone's semen. That's true. It's powerful. Um... <laughs> That's been mating with Rosie Greer's semen. That's been mating with Harrison Ford's semen. That's been mating with, like... Pull somebody from the 90s. <laughs> Corey Hart. The, the 90s. That was 80s, but it's an Where's excellent pull. Uh, Corey right. Hart, I wear my sunglasses at night. I was about to say, fucking, no. He wouldn't have been in that grotto. Um, you're giving this way more thought than I initially... I know, it's like somebody asked me a question. I'm yeah, you were like, real. oh my God, this is the thinking, realest question I've been asked. Thinking of lecherous celebrities who would have been in the grotto in 1994. Eddie Murphy. He's been in that grotto for 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> he's got 87 children. Um, he does have a lot of fucking kids. I think he's been too busy to be in the Playboy grotto, making family and stuff. I read an article where he was like, because you know, somebody was like, what, did, what were you doing? Like, you know, where you seem to go away for a little while. And he said, I just wanted to, he's like, I was working since I was 17. He's like, and I did my first movie when I was like 21 or something like that. Mm. He's going, I just wanted to sit on the couch and be a dad. And I guess that happens to like everybody. Like, could you imagine? Like, the Eddie Murphy's dreams came true at a young age and it went beyond his fucking dreams. And even he got to a point where he was like, you know what, I'm tired. I mean, I prefer that version to like cloning dinosaurs of the like idle rich dude who's like, what am I gonna do? Just make some babies and raise them. Cost is no object, so it's not like I gotta get another job. I can hire all the help that I need. It's like, no, I'm gonna fucking make dinosaurs. I'm gonna John Hammond this shit because I'm bored and rich. So wait, is your... The, my, my preference. The assertion here is, thank God Eddie Murphy didn't want to make dinosaurs. <laughs> thank God his eyes... Because that sounds like the fucking comedy he should have made, man. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, what have you been up to? Uh, I've been busy. I've been busy. Um, I, uh, I got a new job. What is it? Uh, well, first let me tell you what the old job was, because I haven't been able to talk about the old job. And I'm still not able to, but I quit it, so I kind of don't care that much. You had a job that you quit? I had a job that I quit to take another job that I just started. Um, the job that I quit was yeah. the, the show that I haven't been able to talk about for like four months now. Um, I was on The Continental. And that's the show that's... Uh, that's the John Wick show. From the John Wick world. About the hotel for assassins. Right, from the Wickiverse. For the Wickiverse, yes. That's totally not, not what we call it. Um, Wick world, which sounds worse. Wick world, that's <laughs> actually cute. Mm. Well, yeah, I spent 20 weeks trying to build stories set in a hotel um, about, uh, about maybe John Wick, maybe not John Wick. I don't know. If it gets weird, we'll just cut this from the podcast, but you guys get to know. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. Okay. Now it's time for the in. sexy talk. Hey. Well, oh, oh, shit. Oh. It was about to work blue for a second. <laughs> um, but no, it was super fun. Like it's, you, you get to do all the things that I love to do, which is take a, take a piece of IP and find new stories to tell mm. in a world that you're kind of familiar with. And, uh, and find new nooks and crannies and find new ways to dramatize what are ultimately classic stories. There's only, you know, what, 37 some odd dramatic situations in the world. Maybe that, yeah, that's a lot. It feels like it. Um, but there's a book called The 37 Dramatic Situations, which lists every kind of permutation of story. And you can mix them together, whatever, but there's 37. But to pick one, and be like, what's this one? It's revenge. This one is homecoming. This one is man versus nature. This one is, uh, you know, tragedy. This one is heartbreak. Like, there's modes of story to pick one that fits in that kind of world and it was super great um and all set in the hotel uh were you allowed to leave the premises we could leave the premises it was it was less about being in the hotel mm. but like sort of the world that the hotel will sort of create right um and 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 feed and in some cases cannibalize on uh, so it was super fun like it was a really good time but uh but then i got a call from the future and they was like hey do you want to listen to starfleet and i said fuck yeah i do um, so I started yesterday on Star Trek Picard. Oh, fuck! Yeah! Fucking A! Which is the craziest fucking thing. Uh, you're a Star Trek kid, right? The very... Is that why you posted that script? Yeah. I saw the script cover to something like a spec script you wrote. What is that? That was uh, when I was in college, there was a, a writing for a TV competition mm -hmm. that was sponsored by Ubu Productions, which doesn't exist anymore, but they made Family Ties back in the day. Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog. Um, yeah. and, uh, and they sponsored this writing competition. One of my professors was like, hey, man, like, you should enter this. Like, you're a pretty decent writer. Um, you, know, you, have a, you have a capacity for this. You should enter this competition. I said, well, I don't watch very much TV. And you had to write an, a sample episode of a show to enter. And he's like, well, you must watch something. And I was like, well, the only thing I watch is fucking Star Trek. And he said, well, then write a Star Trek. So he did. So I sat down and wrote a Next Generation episode, because that was my Star Trek at the mm -hmm. time. Um, was Next Gen, so I wrote a Next Generation episode. I sent it off into the wilderness. And then like six months later, I get this envelope in the mail that says, hey, you won. Um, you won the Ubu contest? I won the Ubu Stand, the Ubu, stand. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and so they sent me out to LA for a summer between my junior and senior years of college, and I interned on the Paramount lot. Oh, um, shit. Ubu had a show that was up and running at the time called Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, which, with uh, Mrs. Cunningham. With Mrs. Cunningham. Yeah. This is Gary David Goldberg show. Indeed. Um, and so I interned on that for a couple of Marian weeks. Marion Ross, that was her Marian name. I don't want to reduce her to a fucking <laughs> character. Mrs. Cunningham, well, we Marion Ross, but yeah. Yeah, we know. Um, that was a very acclaimed show. So you saw some of the making of that show? A little bit. Like, they were, the, most of the scripts had been written, and they were in production at the time. And they were like, hey, listen, we should maybe put you on a show where there's actual writing being done. Um, I happen to, this is Gary to talk to me. He's like, I happen to know Rick Berman, who's running the Star Trek stuff that's just across the lot. Do you want to go do that? I said, yeah, man, I want to go do that. <laughs> and so it was the, the summer when they were starting season five of Next Generation. They were shooting Time's Arrow, I think, was the, the premiere. And they were starting Deep Space Nine. Mm. Um, literally, like they had just built the first sets. They had shot a pilot, but they were just up and running. And they were building the writer's room and starting to listen to pitches. And I got to sit in on all of that. And it was phenomenal and super instructive and educating and illuminating. Mm. And then I went and had a life that was 20 years not doing Star Trek. And did you wait? Did you work on Deep uh, Space Nine? Yeah, I was in. I was helping um, take notes. I was reading scripts. Star Trek was the only show in the history of TV that had an open writer policy. 
where you could be from anywhere in the world and write a script and send it to Star Trek and they would consider it. Um, Did they ever shoot a script from Miranda? Um, yeah. Did they really? A lot of, Jane Espenson got her start. Jane Espenson who worked on Buffy and Angel and Firefly and she wrote a spec script and sent it to Star Trek and they bought it. And they brought her in and she pitched other ideas. Ron Moore, who created Battlestar Galactica, entered that way. A friend of mine, Jose Molina, wrote a script for Star Trek and got invited to be an intern and then started a TV career. Uh, it happened, not, not gonna say all the time, right. but way more than, than you would think. Than you'd think. So wait, you were working as a writer's assistant. I was reading scripts because the interns all got to read the slush pile of like, here's the like nine-year-old tall stack of scripts we got this week. <clears throat> Somebody's got to read these. And so you're sitting there like, oh man, this sucks. But I got to not say that it sucks in the way that it really does. I got to leave some hope. And so yeah, well, your script wasn't great. Uh, you might want to think about some Oh structure. my God, you were doing Fat Man Beyond even back then. <laughs> yes. I was critiqued. They needed me to be like, this script's great. And they needed you to be like, give yeah, it up. Oh, but no. Um, but yeah, and like it got to the point where when I left and went back to college, which I, like my dad wasn't, my parents were not nearly as cool as yours were, where you're like, I'm dropping out of school and I'm going to go be a filmmaker. And I was like, I'm dropping out of school to be a TV writer. They said, no, you're not. <laughs> you're finishing college. And so I finished college and then became a journalist. And, and then it was about 20... To be fair, when I finally told my parents, I want to be a filmmaker, I was 22. So it's not like, True. you know... You were, you were like 20 years old. And I know. To drink but they was living in their house, so they could have said <laughs> no. But at the end of the day, they were like, oh, let him do it. Get it out of his system. <laughs> and then he'll be a waiter. <sighs> but yeah. And so now... Literally some, what my mother said. You'll be a waiter? Yeah. As they thought. They were, she was like, you could be a waiter like your brother. They, there was not, you know, my parents didn't come from a world where it's like, oh, you're clever, you should do something with that. It was just like, oh, you're clever, go wash the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was, it took them a minute. Like mm -hmm. once clerks got picked up, my mother, you know, I've, I've said many times when she first saw it, her reaction to it was like, you spent $27,000 on this piece of garbage? <laughs> and then the movie got picked up and, you know, she's at the premiere on Entertainment Tonight going like, you know, there's some harsh language in it, but like, you know, it's very good. And my son is, you know, she became a, a fan. And now she's hands down like my biggest fan in the world and stuff. But yeah, in the beginning, not necessarily so much. Um, I didn't know that about Star Trek, that anybody could just fucking write a yeah. script. And that was a, that was a Gene Roddenberry edict, is that he felt the show, the franchise, in a, in a great part, the fact that they got to make a next generation was because fans believed in the show as much as they did. Right. And so they should be able to, if they were qualified and talented enough, take part in that success and maybe use that as part of their creating their own futures. It's fucking sweet. And like for that, anybody out there watching, just in case you guys want to do your own Fat Man Beyond, uh, <laughs> send us a script and <laughs> we'll fucking consider it. Man. Uh, let's rod no let's roddenberry that shit man <laughs> let's pick them roddenberries uh you just need to hire an intern to read all this pick them roddenberries yes <laughs> you think that was um, his pickup line it was <laughs> hey, totally awesome. lucille ball that's uh, right well desi, desi lu produced the original desi lu produced it. they never would have been able to make it without without yeah. them and apparently she wasn't like a big lucy wasn't a big sci-fi fan but she was just like oh this sounds good <laughs> And kind of went with it. Like and trend to the stars? Sure, that could make money. Isn't that fucked up, man? Like, because Lucy was like, all right. <laughs> like, st like, Star Trek is still a fucking thing. Yep. J.J. Abrams would not have ever directed a Star Wars movie if not, like, Lucille Ball hadn't been like, yeah, fucking Star Trek. <laughs> it's crazy, man. Uh, that is an interesting causality loop that you just built there. <laughs> Like, well, apparently you owe your fucking latest success oh, to no, Lucille I, Ball as well, so I, you better be like, I love Lucy. <laughs> I'm just saying, there's like astronauts and scientists and like fucking Nobel Prize winners who's like, you know what, Star Trek was my jam. You're like, JJ got to make a Star Wars movie. I mean... We get flip phones I because some motherfuckers watch Star Trek. I guarantee you talk to most astronauts and be like, did you want to go to space or do you want to be J.J. Abrams? And be like, how much does that guy make? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck space, I was there. There's no money in space. Um, wait a second, so go back to getting the job. Uh, how does this happen? It, it happens because I got a fucking DM on Instagram from, uh, I know, like somebody slid into my DMs. It was like, hey. <laughs> you up? You want to write Picard? Yeah. <laughs> 
You want to go to the final frontier? Like, yeah, baby, what are you wearing? I'm wearing my four pips on my collar. You got four pips on your collar? Are you a fucking commander? Nah, son, I'm a captain. <laughs> the DM was like, you up, number one? <laughs> it's like, doing number two. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to 69, number one. Um, so what happened? Make it so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I got a DM. Engage. Sorry. How, who slid into your DMs? Uh, the guy who's running season two of Picard, a guy named Terry Metalis, who did uh, 12 Monkeys and was on MacGyver th this past season, I think, um, was like, hey, um, are you working now? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the Continental. He was like, oh, Oh, the one from Saturday Night Live? I'm like, no, no, not that Continental. <laughs> My God, that's a deep cut right there. And now the Continental. Hello. Um, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, don't go, come back. And he's like, well, when are you, when are you done? And I told him when my contract ended for, for the Continental. And he's like, well, are you a Star Trek fan? And I was like, yeah, man. I'm a Star Trek fan. Yeah, really. Um, I got this. And she was like, well, if you're interested, like, let's come in and sit down and we'll talk. And so I went down there, I met with Terry, and he was like, well, how big a Star fan are you? He was like, well, when I was in college, I taught myself how to play the inner light theme from the episode where Patrick Stewart's Jean-Louis Picard gets sucked into a sort of probe that gives him an 80-year life. With and they were like, life. security. Yeah, yeah, hold on. <laughs> so, security, we got one. <laughs> We're fine. But yeah, I, I dropped my, uh, my deep Star Trek bona fides, and he was like, hey, listen, man, if you want to come and play, I was like, I would love to. You don't know. You don't know. Uh, he was like, we well, I'd love to put some shit in Picard's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Words. <laughs> and other things, maybe. <laughs> what else? Chocolates. <laughs> French chocolate. I got a whole sex rap for him. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. Uh, Make it so. And so like about a month after that, where there was like more meetings and meeting with executives at CBS and meeting with more people and... Oh, so it ain't as simple as like, fucking, I got a DM and I got a job. Yeah. No, you had like, to meet with some people and impress gotta, them? You still gotta like Fuck. do the... Uh, you made it sound easy. I was like, oh, maybe one day somebody will pop up in my DMs and I'll get a TV show and shit. But it sounds like the same old bullshit. You gotta go right. talk to people and impress uh, them and show them you got an idea. Show them that you wear pants when you show up for meetings. <laughs> yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> I don't want to wear pants in this So game. wait, you ran the gauntlet? and I ran the gauntlet. Everyone yeah. approved. Made it through the other side. Uh, apparently there was some, um, some vetting that Terry did and talking to old bosses and old colleagues and old friends. and Asking about you? Asking about me. Really? And apparently all the checks that I sent those motherfuckers paid off because they all said nice things. Fucking A. Yeah. Um, so uh, when it, you, have you been in the room yet? Yeah, today was day two. Today was day two. Still brandy new. Really? Shiny and new, yeah. Wow. Um, how many people in the room? Um, nine, I think, including myself. And uh, sooner, like, so right now they're breaking stories for season two? Yeah. So um, presumably within the next six months, you're going to write a sentence for Picard, and then he's going to say it. He's going to say that shit. You're, that's fucking, <laughs> you're about to command yeah. the commander of a fucking former commander of a starship. And I'm what did they do in season one? Have they, what's the... Uh, it, is, it is very much like Picard, who had been retired and living uh, in his dotage in a chateau in France. You know, it's the, it's the like old gunslinger putting his guns back on, getting called back into the field. Why did he get called back in? Um, there's a very complex, because Star Trek isn't about them easy stories. But it's, uh, it's like, Data might have had a daughter who comes to see Picard and says, my life is in danger. Picard's like, fuck yeah, saddle up. And then he goes into like space. I gotta be honest with you, that sounds more exciting than Trade Federation. Yeah, there's less, less about taxation blockades. Yeah, and yeah. Shit. It's more engaging. Ah. Ah. Um, all right, so he's pulled out of mothballs. Did they bring everybody else out? Um, they're, 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 they're parsing out the, uh, the So one cast. per episode? Like, oh, it's her. Oh, it's well, him. So far, I saw Data in the trailer. Yeah, so far you meet Data, you meet Will Riker, you meet Deanna Troy. Um, seven of Nine. Seven of Nine from Voyager. I saw her, and that's a crossover, right? She yeah. was never on the other one. No, she was on the Voyager show. Um, what about, um, they gonna bring back Wesley or no? Um, I don't know. Come on. I don't know. How could you not? I mean, I do, but I can't say. <laughs> oh, you! Oh my God! I was speculating, but you could fucking know. I could know. 
whatever we say here, if it winds up in the show, you'll owe us money. I say it here, and it comes out there. <laughs> That's nuts. <laughs> um, oh my God, I forgot that you were just talking about how you're working on the show, and we're sitting here, I'm about to go like down the rabbit hole, like, do you think they'll bring Wesley back? And, <laughs> and you're like, like, I don't know. Bring Wesley yeah. back. Do you, do you want us to bring Wesley back? <laughs> Hold on, hey man, we should maybe bring Wesley back. So um, that's fucking dope. How did you know the dude that DM'd you? Um, Please. Mutual friends. Is that all it was? All it was. Todd Stashwick is a buddy of mine who co-hosted a Black Man Beyond with me while you were off in the in the wilderness. Um, he was on Twelve Monkeys, and he, we we're just mutual buddies. And Once again, it's about who you fucking know in this town. It is about who you know and who you uh, you are not an asshole to. That's very very true. That's the important part. Nobody ever tells part. you. Um, that is fucking dope, man. Fucking wow. Look at you. Are, will this job ever be a conflict, you think? With what? Like, I, we can't touch Star Trek or Picard then, right? Um, like, we can't even speculate. If a trailer plays, you can't, even, you can't even talk about it. I can say, wow, that looks good, right? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Like we can sit there and talk about like the Westworld trailers. Like you realize they spent more on the Westworld trailer than they spent on most movies. And I gotta then say that about Picard. Is that true? Have you seen the Westworld trailer? It, yeah, but I mean, isn't the trailer made up of all footage from the? But they spent more on the fucking show than they spend. Like, yeah, it looks easy. like it looks like eight, they spent on a show. eight Terminator two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very very impressive. But it, honestly, like it's been so long that I thought I was out of the loop on that. I was like, oh, I haven't watched that show in seasons. But it's only season three. Yeah. So I've just haven't watched season two. So now I'll go back and watch season two. Maybe. Do you yeah. need to? I don't know, but, but season two is not great. Will I need to in order to? Yeah. It probably couldn't hurt, but no. I hope that they would make it to the new people who didn't maybe watch the crappy season two can pick up with season three. Um, if they're smart. I like to believe they're smart. Fair enough. And that's how you get jobs on cool shows, by shitting on other shows. <laughs> One must choose sometimes. This is so true. I watched a show recently. I watched The Outsider. Do you like The Outsider? Are you watching it? I'm uh, two episodes behind. But I'm, other than that, I'm kind of the way there. I'm, I'm with you. Uh, like, you liking it? No. Oh, really? Yeah, well, here's the thing. That show, uh, the first two episodes, I was fucking in on it. Like, right. the, the Jason Bateman, Bait and Switchman, the Bait and, Bateman and Switch. Yes. Um, nice. I thought was pretty great. Yes. But then, like, I figured out what it was, give or take, by episode three. And you're watching a show with characters who are supposed to be smart, who either can't figure it out or won't listen to the one lady who has figured it out. Right. And so you're like, why is everybody so fucking dumb? And I just, it bothers me when I'm this far ahead. And I don't think I'm the only one who's this far ahead. And it's like, oh, no, I, yeah, yeah, no, this is no-brainer. Like, I get it. I thought it was well-made. Um, and I was with it every step of the way, but the last episode is, uh, yeah. you're like, oh, oh. Like, That's it? Yeah, it's just like, it's pretty, I thought they built very, very nicely, but then at the end, it's like, what else are you gonna do? Especially, like at one point, I was sitting there watching it, and again, I thought everybody did a great job, but I was like, oh, it's it, again. Like, they're going into a cave to fight a monster that's got no fucking form, but he can look like other people and stuff. Um, you know, but I say that as if, if fucking Stephen King ever saw anything I ever did, he'd be like, oh, it's Clerks, again, fuck you, you know, <laughs> something like that. But it did feel very similar. It felt like, it felt like it without a clown. No? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it feels like it should have been a movie and not a show. And if it needed to be a show, it needed to not be 10 episodes long. Because they did pull the taffy a yeah, little it's, bit. It's trying to sustain more than I think that story has the energy to sustain. So you're like, oh, all right. Let's talk about this lady now who's a real estate agent who now decides to sue the police. Why do I care about this lady's real estate agency issues and her litigation plan? Like, I don't. I want to know who fucking killed these children. Right. Like, it's every now and again, they are not putting the camera on the story the audience is interested in in an effort to kind of, like, buff out a world that we're not that crazy about. It's weird, man. I'm so not a demanding viewer like that never occurred to me I was like all right I'm like this, this is the pace they're telling the story and like honestly what I do is I watch something like that and I'm like oh I suck at my job because it would never occur to me to do something like this this seems classy but what you're telling me is you're sitting there going like this is fucking boring I know it's like be more entertaining like yeah. Kev <laughs> that's fucking dope um, um, you know what I did watch and love what high fidelity 
How is it? It's so fucking good, man. It's crazy. How many good. episodes? It's uh, 10 episodes, half hour each episode. And is it, how does it relate to the movie? Um, there are, it's, it's a loose adaptation of the book, and less the movie. It's more about the book than it is the movie. But it drops a lot of what is now, in hindsight, kind of weird toxic masculinity on the part of, of John Cusack's character, where mm -hmm. like he is so inward flecting and he's so, everything becomes a list and that's his virtue and also his downfall, but that he begins ranking women according to some, like it just gets very oddly sexist and misogynistic in ways that the TV show finds ways to subvert because the main character is now um, Lisa Bonet Prime, uh, which is so fucking weird looking at Zoe Kravitz because every now and again you look Flat at her. Flat out stole her identity for a second there. <laughs> yeah. But like you look at her, it's like, oh no, she's Wasn't her mom in the original? Yeah. Which That's is, cute. Yeah. But she's not related. She's playing John Cusack's character. Right. Yeah. Right. But every now and again you look at her and it's oh shit, that's fucking Lisa Bonet. And then she just turns her head and says, No, it's Zodi Kravitz, and she's great. Never mind that. That's Catwoman right there. That's Catwoman. There's it's your Lena Catwoman. Kyle, man. I saw a picture of her with the haircut and I was like, oh, that looks like, you know. Hey now. Yeah. Looks like Selena Kyle. Yeah. But High Fidelity is great. Like it's it is it is all about sort of the the inward damage that one does when they're not sure who they're supposed to be. Um, even though if you're living where exactly where you're supposed to live, in a time where you're supposed to live, you found a thing you want to do. Um, which is, I, I want to help bring people joy through music, but I'm obsessive about it. And, and she's, she sabotages herself in the most interesting ways. When's it set? Present? Um, present, yeah. Current day. Are they still at a record shop? Which I buy, given the resurgence of vinyl. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I get it. But yeah, it's still very much like when a record shop. They, uh, uh, they cast the woman who was in Bowfinger, the female lead in, in oh, fucking Bowfinger. I want to keep, um, Dolomite. Dolomite is my name. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Divine uh, Joy Randolph, is that her name? Um, the one who uh, was that his friend who was yeah. like his confidant and yeah, stuff? Yeah, his sassy black friend. That, she has a really wonderful scene in, in Dolomite is my name when she, like when he's talking about not wanting to do the sex scene. Mm -hmm. This is the same actress I'm yeah, thinking yeah. about when she's just like, make it funny. Make it funny. Really like warm, beautiful. Delivery. She did a great job yeah. in that movie. That, movie. that whole movie is fantastic. She's the Jack Black character. Oh, get out of here. Yeah. So she's the like the crazy loud, like swinging into the fucking record store. And she's amazing. She's great. I'm in. Yeah. No, it's, it's one, it's, it is the girls that I always wanted girls to be, but never was. And I wanted to like girls a lot. The, the oh, you mean girls the show. Not girls in general. <laughs> I thought you meant the, in the Why concept aren't all of all of girls. you different? Why can't all women be like these women? I mean, I know you're all different, different, but be different this way, the way that <laughs> yeah. I want it. Two types. So then I can rank you like I'm in a, like a Nick Hornby novel. Um, Is that what he did in the book? Did you ever read the book? I did read the book. And, you know, I read it at a time where I was also a shitty dude and, uh, and then got older. Was the book good? It is good. Did you Funny. read the book because of the movie? Yeah. Because you liked the movie? Yeah, yeah. I went back. How close was the book to the movie? N not quite. I mean, the, the spirit is the same, but the book is set in London and the, the movie's in Chicago. How close is the series to the book? Um, wildly different in ways and then very specifically the same in ways. What city is it set in? Uh, New York. The show's in New York. Okay. And it's very much about that New York. And it's about that New York and what it's like being like 30-something with a little bit of money and no real attachments and the life that you can live, the sort of weird, awesome, nomad, bougie, bohemian life you can have in New York. It's, it's, it's very much about the possibilities of being an adult with means in a city like that. You were literally the second person I've had a protracted conversation uh, about uh, this show with in the course of the last six hours. Chris Summer, who does mm -hmm. a voice on our um, uh, Masters of the Universe show, was talking about the show, because I guess she's Zoe's godmother or something. She's like, the show is so good, and and we were talking, and I was I was quizzing on the same things. So I, I, that's the universe telling me to watch it. You should watch it. I'm in. And it goes down so easy. Hey. <laughs> hey. Good to know. Um, I'm trying to think what else I watched while I was I watched. Um, I saw a fucking movie, man. That like. Really? Oh, I did. I saw Invisible Man. That was well done. Did you see it? No, because I'm a wuss. It's, it's, <laughs> it's really well done. I thought it was very clever. And, if, and then I, later on, I found out they made it for like $7 million. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, 
it's incredible. And then you sit there going, you know what? Like an Invisible Man movie is a cheap movie to make. <laughs> you just you're missing somebody. It's the whole time. cameo. Pretty basically. much, it's like just shooting landscapes and shit. Um, but it was insanely well done. That cat was his name Lee Wannell. One L. Lee One L. What a well done man. And you know it was really dope to me. I mean, is it deep enough we can talk about it? I don't want to spoil it, but like, how do you, you know you fucking the guy's invisible? You know yeah, that yeah. much. We got that. Do you know how he's invisible? No. Nope. That I enjoyed immensely. Ooh. Because it is really like, that's one of those concepts that's like, in a world of believable movie sci-fi concepts, invisibility is real tough to get your head around because it's like, what, you came up with a serum and now I can't fucking see you? This makes no sense. <laughs> Somebody says, I become a werewolf because, uh, you know, the moon. I'm like, oh, I buy that. That makes sense. But the idea <laughs> of fucking that was always like, come on, man. It's technology based this time around, and it makes okay. so much sense. It's probably like, like technology based in the way like this will never really happen. But it's just enough techno babble to make you go like, oh, that fucking you could technically be invisible if one could invent. Mm -hmm. In the same way that when you watch like Iron Man, you're like, oh, that science makes sense if you're in a sci-fi universe and stuff. <laughs> Speaking of which, oh, have you seen all the fucking ink about? Um, Fucking uh, the Dr. Mage, the sequence in, you know, it, I, guess, I guess it's Disney Plus, so they're putting it on that fat Blu ray box set or something, but all this shit about stuff they cut out of Infinity War and Endgame and mm. stuff. So they showed like boards and they talked about um, during the sequence where uh, Doctor Strange was being held captive by Ebony Maw and he's sticking the needles in his face, and then Spider Man was like, oh, did you ever see aliens or whatever? Mm. Fuck. Originally, Tony was gonna send the armor down to Doctor Strange in the way he could in, in Iron Man 3, and then the armor covered him and turned him into Doctor Mage. And the, instead of the, you know, the arc reactor, it built around the eye of Agamotto. And then Tony was wearing Doctor Strange cape and it brought him down to him after however they dispatched Ebony Maw. And there's footage or a photo of Robert Downey Jr. wearing the cape that was, came out long before Infinity War came out. It was an early like, press release photo or something like that. So we know they shot it. We know personally that they shot it because when the, the writers, Mar mm -hmm. McFeely and um, Marcus. Marcus, came and, and spoke to us at the house before they went to do the big shindig and shit for Endgame, before they left, they were like, you want to see something? <laughs> and they pulled out the phone and literally showed us not just a drawing, because that's what's going around the internet is there's a drawing and shit. It looks badass and shit. But they showed us fucking Sherlock in the <laughs> Iron Man fucking suit, man. Like wearing the goddamn suit with Tony standing next to him wearing the cape. And we were like, what the fuck? And they're like, we, we can't, can't say. They're like, we can't say. No one never will tell ever anybody. talk about it. Never tell anybody and shit. And then it's out in the world, and I'm like, oh my god, we saw that fucking photo. It looked badass, man. But like, what they did in the movie was totally cool too, mm -hmm. and, and it probably solved a lot of problems. More importantly, but it looked fucking cool. They built that fucking suit, and what's his name was wearing it, man. They fucking uh, no Cumberbatch. He was wearing that fucking suit. <laughs> Anyway, we sidetracked severely. Okay. I saw a fucking movie, Haunted Me, still stays with me. It's called Swallow. I've I found it on iTunes. Holy fuck, man. It's about, you know what pica is? Yes. So like dogs will eat like dirt or dog shit or like fucking rocks and there's no nutritional value. And people are like, why the fuck they do it? And they're like, it's pica. That's what it's called. Human beings do it as well, apparently, and there are some people that just eat shit that has no nutritional value because whatever, they're dealing with some shit, they've got some issues, yeah. obviously. Or Twinkies. Yes, yes, <laughs> baloney, not just that kind of no <laughs> nutritional value. Like people that eat, like in the movie, she's this wife who's married to this exec and he's kind of controlled by his parents, so he seems kind of controlling with her and shit, and they have a pristine house, and she's kind of stay-at-home wife, and, and like she's, clearly bored out of her fucking mind and alone and by herself and then later on in the movie you found out some backstory stuff that 
helps a lot, make, make a lot more sense. So she finds like a marble, like a kid's marble, and she swallows it. And like she seems so fucking delighted by this. And then like a couple scenes later, she's in the bathroom, presumably shitting it out. She puts on a glove. As soon as she put on the glove, I was like, I'm in. Because I knew she was going to go digging for, through her shit through the marble. I'm like, this movie's fucked up, man. <laughs> and she does, pulls on the rubber glove and she starts digging, pulls out the marble, has some movie shit on it. And then she washed it off and she puts it on this fucking mirror. And the way she put it on, I'm like, and I ain't going to be the only one. Like, it, it, I know they're going to cut back to that mirror and there's going to be more shit. And God damn it, they did. Because she keeps eating shit the whole movie, man. She eats a fucking thumbtack. Oh no! Yes, she eats a safety pin. At one point, she eats a battery. At one point, she eats a screwdriver. It's fucking, it's, it's batshit, dude. But apparently, like, there are people that do this sort of thing. It's a real thing. And she, at one point, she's eating dirt. Like, it was fascinating as a character study. Not just like, that's fucked up. But it, as a, like, the performances were off the charts wonderful. I'd never seen this movie before. You know what I watched after that? Did you ever see Midnight Special? Yes. Wonderful movie. Uh -huh, Michael Shannon. Michael Shannon. Very original, but at the same time, I've seen the movie before in as much as, like, it reminds you of E.T. Like, yeah, we did Tyler, whatever. Or Star Man. It's like, this motherfucker might not be from here, and we got to get him back where he's got to go. Mm -hmm. That story exists. This fucking story, where I'm like, I swallow shit because I'm alone. Holy fuck, man. Like, <laughs> I never saw that before. <laughs> I was in 100%. They couldn't fucking stop. But it was one of those movies, too, where everything she kept eating, I'm like, ah, I'm like real squeamish and shit. Like, at one point, because I'm sitting there now, like, movie like that, you're trying to, like, where the fuck is this going? You know what I'm saying? Like, you watch most movies, you're like, I figure it's going to go here, here, here. Suddenly you're like, how the fuck are, like, it's only, and it's one of those movies you keep pressing the pause because you're like, how deep are we? And it's like 20 minutes, and you're like, there's like 90 more minutes of this shit? Like, where is it gonna go? So early on, she gets exposed, like fucking, cause she's like doubled over. Geraldo Rivera shows up at her house. <laughs> yes, like, and like Al Capone's vault, he opens her up and shit. Um, she's pregnant, she's having a kid. Oh. So at one point she's doubled over, they bring her to the hospital. Oh no, they're doing a sonogram. It's even before she gets into distress. They're doing a sonogram on her and shit. And the lady doing the sonogram is like, well, there's the baby, there's the legs and shit. And she's like, wait a second, there's something here. And they look down and they find like a bunch of shit that we didn't see her eat in the movie that has just been collecting in her stomach because you can't digest it. And they fucking make an incision and they're with a scalpel, bro. They're pulling out like a safety pin with like fucking hair on it and shit. Oh. It was fucking, I'm telling you, it captured my imagination in such a big, normally I watch shit and I'm on my phone at the same time, but this I was like, no, 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 go on. <laughs> What's Insanely next? Insanely well done, insanely well done. Riveting fucking picture, man. I have no skin in the game, but fucking swallow. Go check it out. I swallowed it whole. Yes. Now, uh, <laughs> Kevin Smith. <laughs> I did not spit, Kevin Smith. <laughs> Swallow, you won't spit, Kevin. There's the perfect <laughs> quote right there. It's a fantastic movie, man. Uh, I am. Uh, I'm never gonna watch it. But, I'm gonna... <laughs> but you know I'm... what I'm watching next is a movie you were singing its praises, uh, Fast Color. Ooh. It was between Midnight uh, Special and Fast Color, and I want Midnight Special. But next up in my queue is I'm gonna watch that. I, I, you sang its praises. I Aren't they doing a TV show too? Yeah, Amazon is doing it. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, I cannot wait to talk about Fast Color. Because much like Into the Spider-Verse, I could talk about Fast Color all Are the time. Are you doing that? Mark has been doing a series that he kicked off when? Last night? Last night was the first uh, installment of the Minority Report, which is a film series that I do at the... Is that uh, what it's called? Minority Report. That's awesome. Yeah. At, uh, at the Alamo Draft House, where we're looking at genre films through a somewhat diverse lens. Meaning, like, diverse storytellers, diverse content, diverse actors, diverse points of view. And so the first movie was Serenity. Which uh, Joss Whedon Serenity, not the weird ass uh, Matthew McConaughey. Um, no, yeah, that's right. <laughs> there that's was weird. another Serenity. And you know that you might say to yourself, self, that's not the craziest diverse film I've ever seen, and you'd be right. But the thing that I want, also wanted to talk about in the series is, as much as there are movies that are all about diversity, and the second film in the series is Into the Spider Verse, mm -hmm. which is that. But there's also the thing that you have to do when you're a person of color watching genre films, especially older genre films is kind of squint a little bit at it. 
and be like, I don't quite see myself in here, or it's a little bit problematic, but I still love it anyway. Right. And it's, it's finding your way into something. In Serenity, if you know anything about the Joss Whedon and Firefly world, it's a world in which China was the dominant cultural and economic force that eventually kind of overtook America as the prime. Um, so it's a documentary about now? Very much so. Um, but and so in the future, China was the dominant force, so everybody speaks Chinese, everybody's names are kind of Chinese, there's Chinese writing everywhere, except that there are no Asian actors on the show. And it's like, if you're gonna make a show that's all about that this is the world in is the Is that intentional China, or no? It's, I don't not, know. Not for the plot, like the, no, uh, every Asian person died. They no, just didn't have that. an Asian person They just didn't the have show. an Asian person. Including there are two characters whose last name is Tam, which is total Asian name, played by white people. Um, very good white people. I love the cast, mm. but it's just it's that weird blind spot that that show has. That if you're a fan of it and a fan of color, especially an Asian fan, you've kind of got to just swallow and move past if you're going to find your way to love it. Swallow. A subtle reminder, kids. Swallow. <laughs> now now <what> I <laughs> at home video, ready to watch. So yes, the first one was Serenity. We sold out Serenity. Um, and you're doing it all year long? All, every month. Once a month? Once a month. You put up the uh, tickets today for the second one, which is Into the Spider-Verse. Yep. Are the tickets still available? They are not. Sold out that quickly? Sold out in hours. Wow. Um, what are you going to do third? Are you not announcing until the second one? Um, I'm not going to announce. Yes, I'm really looking forward <laughs> to doing it. That's our edit point. There it is. That's the cut. I see. <laughs> um, so for those who miss tickets for uh, both uh, rounds now, um, they'll just have to pay attention. Where do they go? To the Alamo, Alamo Draft Toss? Alamo website. Um, and I think the way it's going to end up working is that I'll announce the next film in the series the day after we screen you do the, the previous next thing. one. So. And you're doing a, are you doing a guest for Spider-Verse? Is that what I said? Um, I think we're going to get Peter Ramsey, the Oscar-winning director, oh, shit. Uh, into the Spider-Verse to come and talk. That's amazing. Which is fucking awesome. Great get. Woo! Great get for that show. What the fuck about your home show, <laughs> man? Like, I've been booking guests like a motherfucker, dude. I know. You've been killing it while I was away, man. Like <laughs> Nothing but uh, love from the audience and shit like that. No, it was so much fun. But, uh, but it was always like biding my time. Until my husband got You're back. very sweet. Got to keep the bed warm. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you. <Pat. laughs> um, but, but at the same time, like building the, the brand as well. Like I was so proud of you when I saw that you were doing the, the series at the Alamo Draft House. That's, mm -hmm. you know, this is a cat who you know, has never hesitated when I was like, hey, let's do this. He's like, okay. But at the same time, was never like, you know, there are a lot of people in my life who are like, hey, let's do this. And I'm like, okay. Like, I had to talk Mark into shit. Mark wasn't like, oh, I can get some shit done through this guy. Here's all my fucking dreams. Instead, I was like, you want to fucking talk about Batman? And he was like, <laughs> all right. And from that, from a guy who was like a writer only and then an editor for a while and, and a, and, uh, a guy like me who dreamed of being in the business and shit like that, watching you fucking open up like a flower over the last few years, man, where it's like suddenly you're doing this, suddenly you're doing this. You're so multifaceted at this point, man. It just makes my heart sore, man. Well done. Well, thank you. I, uh, Excellent job. It is, it is very much in the model of like, I, I always tell people, say, ah, what's it like working with Kevin? He's the hardest working dude I know because there's always fucking something else is happening. If there's not one thing, shit. it's five things, and it's all, it's all chasing bliss, um, and sometimes swallowing pills that you might not want to swallow. I mean, it gets swallowed into almost everything. <laughs> it's haunting you now as it well. Is. <laughs> That's what it is, it's chasing bliss, man. Like, fucking go for the thing that makes you happy. If you can make a little scratch at the same time, God bless, but like, chiefly you go for the thing that makes you fucking happy, man, and like, the, the screening series like is clearly making you happy and more importantly making the audience fucking happy for you to sell out in fucking hours after putting up those tickets yeah. for sale that's great and it's not like heavy advertising it's not like fucking there's commercials and shit yeah, it's you put literally me putting it up on fucking twitter or instagram and i don't impressive. have that big a footprint um but it's 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 getting to talk about things that i love and getting to talk about why i love them and even if it's problematic, you know, so much of being alive in the world is finding ways to love the things that, that, are, that are dinged on the outside. Yeah. The things we love, we don't love because they're perfect. We love them because of their flaws. 
and be that movies, be it TV shows, be it people. Like, it ain't nothing perfect, but you got to find your way in. And also, you bring more people into it, too. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are like, I love this shit, too. That's why I'm here. But you always have the chance to reach somebody new who's like, oh, I never fucking seen Serenity. You know, I'll give it a shot now and stuff. And, and it's so important to grow fans, new fans particularly. Like, you know, catch people who haven't been with you from the jump or with a thing from the fucking jump. That's how a thing keeps living. I, I got, you know, I've been out on the road for four months and stuff, so I've seen the fan base and a lot of them look like me in as much as they're middle-aged and they've been with me since like, fucking the 90s when I started with the clerks. But then there's like waves of like, oh my God, are those 20 year olds? And like, oh my God, did somebody bring a fucking teenager and shit? And, and, and you know, you're so like disturbed by it at first where you're like, fucking who would bring, like, why are you here? First you see a teenager, you're like, why the fuck are you even here? Like, how would you even understand all these old references and shit like that? And they're like, well, my parents used to watch the movie with my parents. Like, I can, I, they, we'd get together, we'd watch them. They, they were our thing. And then you're like, who, what fucking irresponsible parent would show you these movies? And that irresponsible parent would stand up and be like, me. And they were there with the person, man. It's important to like, well, it's important to my bottom line, of course, to pass on fandom to somebody else. But it's just important to pass on fandom in general, to go out there and advocate for the shit you like, even if like people aren't talking about that fucking thing anymore, man. Like, it, it you know, while we're here, we might as well speak about the man on your fucking shirt, Max von Sydow. The late great Max the von Sydow. The late Ma great Max von Sydow. Um, when, you know, I saw that he passed and sadly passed, how old, 90, 91? 90. 90 years old, huge bucket of win, as we say on Hollywood Babylon. Tickets for that going on sale very soon. Well done. Um, it, 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 I looked at his entire career, and we talked about very briefly back in the alleyway before we jumped in our green room. Like, yeah, he was one of the most respected actors in the fucking world, and then he, had, he worked with Bergman, fucking Seven Seal, and we all know him as the man who literally fucking played chess with death. He's a, mad, he's a fucking living metaphor as an actor and shit like that. So he's had classy, classy ass fucking roles. But he also did a fuck ton of genre. Yes. So and that put him squarely in our world. So it's one thing when you lose like a great actor and shit, but it's another thing when you're like, we lost Ming the fucking Merciless, man. We yeah. lost Brewmeister Smith, man. We lost fucking the dude from Dune. Who'd he play in Dune? Oh, Kynes. Yes. Um, we lost Jesus. He played Christ yeah. once. Yeah. And, yeah, and the devil as well, man. That's right, in Needful Things, he was the devil as well. Um, he was a dude who followed his bliss, and if his bliss took him to fucking Judge Dredd, all right, I'll do Judge Dredd. If he takes him to Conan, I'll do Conan, I'll be King Osric, sure. And he fucking elevated everything. Never once did he do something where you're like, ugh, Max von Sydow, fucking blue. Yeah. Like, whatever he did, even if you didn't like the movie, like Judge Dredd, you know, fucking, the moment he, he's, I'm not I'm not big I'm <laughs> yeah. And he doesn't have his helmet on, you're like, what the fuck? But Max was like fucking, so damn strong in a movie, like in many times throughout his entire career, so damn strong and earnest in a movie that probably didn't deserve it or where nobody else was given it as much. So classy that he treated like A-list material, clearly great material, the same that he would treat material that other people would just kind of throw away and shit. Mm -hmm. like, it, it, what an astounding career, but you're absolutely right. He followed his fucking bliss, man. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and there's the high and there's the low. There's that for every three days of the condor, you know, there's fucking never say never again. Which he was still good in, man. He's always He, he was a Blofeld. Like, he, every time. And maybe it's the, the accent, the delivery, the voice, or maybe he was just that fucking good. Like, maybe it's like you're so used to seeing movie stars and shit that when you see someone who is a full utility, all-around performer, actor, man, that can, like, do anything, it's astounding. You're like, well, he's one off. But shouldn't all shouldn't they all be like that? <laughs> like, I wish I was that fucking talented, man. What a crazy, wonderful career. How many people did that guy make happy? Yeah, I mean, even playing the bad guy. And like getting to like live in fucking Conan and Star Wars and Game of Thrones and Indiana. He was in Young Indiana Jones. Like he's found his way into almost every sort of franchise, every family, every legacy thing that we love. And wasn't snobby about it. No. Like, just fucking, ah, yeah, you want me to show up and do this? Happy to. Yeah. Pay me my quote, I'll be there. And I'll be good at it. 
I read something online recently where like somebody mentioned Strange Brew to him and he played Brewmeister Smith and he was fucking amazing. But somebody mentioned to him and he instantly broke into a wide smile and he was like, I forgot about that one. <laughs> and he suddenly was warm, you know, like even that, like the fact that he shows up, let alone shows up to a Strange Brew, let alone gives like an incredibly funny and earnest performance at the same time, plays against type and uses his ability mm -hmm. to like fucking make the character more harsh. Ugh, he'll be missed, man. I mean, that was an actor who like, it's a lot of actors that, that when they pass, I'm like, man, I wish I'd worked with that cat. I never wish I worked with him because I always felt like he was way out of my fucking league. Like who would he play? Fucking Silent Bob's grandpa? Like there's <laughs> nothing, I would never do anything. And maybe with Red State, like I might've got close. Like he could have been like, you know, if there was no Michael Parks, like a great, Mm. Pastor Abe and Cooper and stuff, but he he was he was too good for me to even dream about like what would it be like to work with him and stuff. I envy JJ. JJ got to work with him, right? Yeah. Like on yeah, Force Awakens. on Force Awakens, and it was a strong way to begin the movie, man. Like oh my God, they got fucking. Yeah. You're like holy shit, they got Max von Sydow, and then fucking you're like holy shit, they just killed Max von Sydow. <laughs> <laughs> They're like we got so much money, we're gonna kill everybody. <laughs> Every old dude you love. We'll save a few for the rise of Skywalker. <laughs> but yes, R.I.P. Max von Sydow. Yeah, well played. Big time. Um, all right, we gather to talk about news. Should we dive into the Let's news? Fucking do some news, man. Mark's got news. Everybody, give it up for Mark Bernard. And he's got some news for you. Uh, Take us to that juicy newsy the place. Juicy newsy. Uh, before we get too deep into it, uh, your thoughts on the Batmobile? Since we first sat down, we got a good look at both the Batman and the Batmobile. I'm going to pronounce it wrong a lot. Um, how's your feeling on the, uh, the hashtag family uh, Fast and the Furious Batmobile? Yeah, they, it was a uh, Bat and the Furious. I, I think it, it's cool. It looks like, it reminds me of uh, the Barris Batmobile a little bit. Like mm. in as much as, hey, they took a normal car and retrofitted it. Right. Um, I, I'm, I'm not taking anything away from Nolan. You never want to say anything anti-Nolan because fuck, they'll come and kill you and shit. But I, you know, the Tumblr was not, I was like, all right, I get it. But it it's was a tank. Yeah. And so, and, but to be fair, like I thought, you know, Zach's Batmobile was like, well, that looks complicated, you know. <laughs> um, I, I, but at the same time, my favorite Batmobile of all time is Tim Burton's Batmobile, which is also an overly complicated fucking vehicle and stuff. But that's, I love that Batmobile. Uh, but this, I was like, I didn't, I didn't ch it didn't chafe at all. I wasn't like, what the fuck? If they're doing a year one, year two story, mm. this all makes sense. That like, he doesn't have the fucking brand new goddamn expensive supercar and shit. Um, I, it looks like they're doing progression on the costume. Mm -hmm. So like by the end of the movie, we'll probably see something that's a little more uniform, but it feels like he's piecing it together and seeing what works and mm -hmm. shit like that. Um, in, in the storyline, I guess. That would be my conjecture based on the very limited stuff we've seen so far. Um, but I like it, man. The helmet reminds me very much of an Elseworlds Batman story where he played, I don't know, it wasn't the pirate one, maybe it was the... Gotham by yeah. Gaslight. It very lo much looks like Gotham by Gaslight to me. Like the the hell. Yeah, 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 a little bit Mignolish. Um, but I'm in, man. Like fucking, he, he's, it's one thing that I was like, oh man, I wish that hadn't got out. Was they showed footage of him on a bat cycle. Yeah. And it looked pretty dope. And then all of a sudden he dumps right by camera, and I'm like, <laughs> nobody needs to see Batman <laughs> dumping on a motorcycle. But it looks, it looks cool, man. I'm in. I, I think he's doing the right things. But let's talk about the big fucking news, the, right? The rumor of the week. There's a big rumor going around that says they've been talking to Johnny Depp about possibly playing the Joker in his the bat in Matt Reeves' the Batman movie. Mm -hmm. Now this is the first anyone's even heard about there being a possibility of a Joker in the Batman movie on the heels of the Joker, which won Oscars and made over a billion dollars and Joaquin just locked that part down. But it looks like, you know, now this is Oscar bait part. Who the fuck wouldn't want to play the Joker? Like uh, Heath Ledger won an Oscar, Joaquin Phoenix won an Oscar. And of all the actors out there that could possibly like take a roll the dice on the Joker, Johnny Depp actually kind of fucking perfect. That's a rumor that's going around. Is I, I don't know where it came from, but there's been some conjecture online. Yeah, like I read it in the India Times, which doesn't fill me with a ton of confidence. Um, 
Not that India can't have a good news Yeah, service. what the fuck, Mark? <laughs> Just saying, like, if that's the first place that I see it, it's a little weird. You gotta trace the source back. <laughs> yeah. What would you think? Uh, I, personally, I kind of want to give the Joker a bit of a rest. Like, yeah, but in a world where that's not gonna happen, what do you think? <laughs> like, they're never gonna, that's like, like, let's give Batman a rest. Like, fuck you, he makes a billion dollars all the time. <laughs> I know. It's, uh, I, yeah. Uh, the, let's imagine that, like, it it's one scene. Be. Yes, one scene. He's not the whole movie. One scene toward the end, they're like, fuck, we want to have the Joker and shit, and it's going to be Johnny Depp. What do you say to that? I only want it to happen if he's painted his makeup over a mustache. <laughs> if it's legit Cesar Romero, like just, I'm not going to shave this fucking mustache, but I'm also kind of crazy, so just me, 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 stash. You, you say it in a humorous way, but Johnny Depp's so odd, he might just fucking do that, man. Really? He might be like, the whole thing's an homage to Cesar Romero, so I painted it over my Yes! <laughs> he would be, you gotta admit, he'd be fun, man. Like that, like, of all the parts he's played, he's kind of like perfect for a, a take on the Joker. Um, it would be interesting, to say the least. And if it's in a very small dose, because there's 98 other villains in that movie already. Well, they've got a Riddler. They've yeah. got a Catwoman, mm -hmm. who technically might not be a villain. They've got a... Penguin. Penguin. Do they have a Harvey Dent? No. Sounds like they are doing Long Halloween, doesn't it? Mm. It does. They have a Falcone. Um, and maybe they're not done casting. Maybe that's just all we've heard about and stuff. Yeah. Like, for example, they announced our... Masters of the Universe cast, and I know there are a lot more people that aren't announced that are fucking cool too. That Ooh. I'll tell you later on. <laughs> I recorded some of them today. It was pretty amazing. Am I in it? Yeah, fuck it. <laughs> Jason Mewes has been announced. Yeah. Um, he already recorded his stinkor lines. Well done. Such typecasting. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was wonderful. All right, so wait. Um, Batman. I'm in Joker. for the. I'm in. So far, they have not lost me, but to be fair, we host a show called Fat Man Beyond that was called Fat Man on Batman. Like, I'm in for every iteration of Batman. This one actually has me excited. Yes, I can't wait. I don't understand. I saw some people on Twitter being like shitting on the helmet, but I'm like, I buy it. Some people said the, two, the points were too high. Listen, we endured a dude who couldn't, like, this was his whole That's what fucking you wanna, shit. You want to tell the kids, like, like, our Batman, back in our day, he couldn't even fucking, if he wanted to fight somebody, he'd be like, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 stop that. Stay up behind me. My God, man. The moment, <laughs> imagine, like, the fucking jump the whole thing took when Chris Nolan, like, did that scene where he's just like, you want to be able to turn your head. Like, the whole audience, after 20 years, been like, Yeah! <laughs> Like, it scale that shit. Like, you're gonna sacrifice works. armor for mobility. It I'll really worked. It. But Zach took it back to, like, it was all part of the body suit yeah. and the cape and stuff. So, this looks like separation again. Looks like he could turn his head, right? You'd kind of, like, he was gonna be a fucking ninja. A ninja with, like, 40 degree vision, like, with nothing peripheral. <laughs> Bam! But Whoa! That's, Hold on. But that's how good he is. Even with 40 degree vision, he could still <laughs> kick everybody's ass. Is that you, Killer Croc? No, wait, stop yeah. it. Step in front of me so we can fight. <laughs> All right, what do you got now? I got my mirrors up. Hold on. <laughs> um, Guardians of the Galaxy characters are going to be in fucking Thor Love and Thunder. Says who? Says Vin Diesel, who apparently said way more on the press tour for Bloodshot than he should have. Because... That's the way you get news out of motherfuckers, is you get them a little tired at the end of a day. It's like, hey man, what's next for you? And he said, uh, uh, like James Gunn, he was talking about going back for Guardians. Like James Gunn, you know, he's taking Suicide Squad, so he's about to embark on volume three. Uh, he also talked to me about how Thor will incorporate some of the Guardians of the Galaxy, which would be very interesting. Nobody knows. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. Literally, that's his quote. He just gave away the farm, man. He really fucking did. Wow. I mean, granted, you know... Endgame Maybe he was the leak about Johnny Depp and the Batman as well. <laughs> what else do you want to know? <laughs> uh, I mean, they did tease it, you know, at the very end of Endgame, the Asgardians of the Galaxy. It's good to know it's happening. Good to know that it's happening. Um, also good to know he can say a lot more than I am Groot. He can. When he wants to. And apparently when nobody else wants him to. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's all about family. When's that other movie coming out? Uh, Bloodshot? No, the car movie. Oh, Fast 9. I think... 
May, I want to say, either end of May or early June. And Blood Shot? Yeah. Is that based the, on a comic book? The Valiant Universe. It is a Valiant book, yeah. wasn't it? Uh -huh. When's that coming out? Like three weeks. Oh, I shouldn't think. we be talking about it? This week? This is it, week? It's coming Friday? Do you know anything about it? Uh, Other than the fact that on the fucking press circuit he's talking about <laughs> shit he just lets everything go. Um, I mean, I know generally what the concept is, is that he's basically this universal soldier, right? Like he was a soldier who, thanks to some nanite injection, can kind of never be killed again, brought back from the dead, gets superpowers, and now wants to know who's done this to him and why. And then he'll blow a ton of shut up and he's like, yeah, I live my life a quarter of a mile at a time. <laughs> um, uh, I am Superman. That's coming out in the next three weeks, and then yeah. the, the fast, fast, nine. fast Nine happens this summer. Yeah. So he's got a big year ahead of him. He's got a big year, and then apparently next year we'll bring a, a Thor movie that Groot may or may not be in. I mean, like, is he even, like, do, do you think they even bring him to the set for Guardians of the Galaxy? <sighs> no. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, I'm not taking anything away from him because I love what he does as Groot, but, like, on set, any could, but anybody could just be like, "I am Groot," yeah. like, and move on. And I mean, stuff. James Gunn did most of the dancing, so it's not even like Vin Diesel doing the dancing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, shit, Bradley Cooper. I don't even think he goes to set, does he? Um, he I, does no, because Sean Gunn plays Rocket, Rocket, and he also does the voice. Oh, okay. So then Bradley Cooper dubs it later, so he's never on set either. Mm -hmm. Bradley Cooper and Vin Diesel are two of the fucking luckiest actors on the planet. <laughs> Because they're in a massive franchise, and now they're about to be in a second massive franchise and shit, and they don't even have to show up for work for that fucking job. Although, Just one day in front of a microphone. They're also in the most precarious position, because they're motherfucker, we can get somebody who sounds just like you. Yeah, but... Like, like, not every, you know, Woody is actually Tom Hanks. He's got a brother who needs some work. And so every time Woody's on a TV show, that's like his brother Phil Hanks. <laughs> Like, I'm sure there's somebody who's like, ain't nobody like me but me. There's a dozen fucking guys but that, in Hollywood. But they do that, that because Tom Hanks is like, I'm too busy. They don't use his brother Jim Hanks to be like, we're going to keep you in line, Tom Hanks. <laughs> because if you don't do what we say, Jim Hanks is right the fuck here. And he'll do it for 10% of what you get, <laughs> fucking Hanksy. He is, though. Jim Hanks is the go-to guy for the pull toys mm. and some of the TV shows and yeah. stuff and the interstitials and stuff. But it's like, you know, if all you are is a voice actor and your voice isn't necessarily crazy unreplicable, that's not a word, irreplicable. Um, I don't you, even know that's a word. Yeah. Uh, you may want to, like, not be an asshole about it. Be like, listen, man, we're happy to pay you this money, but if you're an asshole, I can swing a dead cat and hit somebody who can sound like Rocket. <laughs> <laughs> And you could go from I am Groot to I am out of a fucking job. <laughs> Pretty quickly. Um, um, all right, so that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also... I and, can't wait for that. When's that happening? Uh, let's see, what's the release date? And which is going to happen first? Thor, Love and Thunder, or this Guardians of the Galaxy movie? Thor, Love and Thunder. Because that's uh, November 2021. And Christian Bale's your bad guy. He's playing a bad guy. Yeah. Um, what's, Tessa Thompson revealed that? Mm -hmm. She wasn't supposed to? Again, on a press tour. For Westworld. Uh, do you think if you're Kevin Feige, you're like, shut the fuck up! You can't ever do any other job. Oh my God, would you just say the words on the page? <laughs> fuck! All these people always spilling the good news, man. I heard another piece of good fucking news. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that Spider-Man, the new Spider-Man movie, gonna have a lawyer in it? A lawyer? Yes, a famous Marvel Universe lawyer. Is it, is it, is it the She-Hulk? Another famous. <laughs> <laughs> um, Charlie Cox, they're bringing in as, as Matt Murdock. Ooh. That's been the rumor online, and they say that's like the one that like Marvel's like, God damn it, how did that get out? If they do that, yeah. fucking chef's kiss, man. <laughs> because now the rumor behind that rumor is that once they introduce him in Spider Man, Daredevil going to get his own movie with Charlie Cox playing him. Same fucking cast. Ooh. That would be so smart. Oh, my God. Who didn't love that fucking Daredevil? And to give him a chance at the big screen and shit. And, like, you know, look, they're opening up the Marvel fucking toy chest right now. You know, it's not going to be the same six fuckers all the time. It's like, now we're doing this. Now we're trying this. Here's your blind lawyer. Here's I now want a movie called The Same Six Fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's I'm, us again. <laughs> it's true. Look, they're back. The same six fuckers. <laughs> so yeah, they're they're opening it the fuck up, man. So it sounds like Daredevil gonna get his own movie again. And I think that the super exciting thing about that is you dig Daredevil, then Luke Cage is viable, and then the Punisher is viable. Yes. And the Punisher v Spider Man is a legit fucking thing that you oh, can now do. You can't do that, though. It would have to be a PG Punisher or an R-rated Spider-Man. Eh, PG-13 is how you split that difference. Speaking of Spider-Man. Can't protect a red and blue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, they just hired Robert, how do you say his name? Orsi. Orsi um, to write a Spider-Man universe spinoff. Sony mm. just hired him. They're not saying what it is. What do you think it is? Uh... Let's speculate. Let's speculate. You speculate first because I'm going to steal your speculation, I feel. Um, I'll fucking say you're reading. Uh, I am. Reading. I'm reading. This is from the, Tom Curley wants me to sign his book, but he says, Kevin, I'm no Scott Mosier, but I did win an Oscar for mixing Whiplash. Is that fucking true? Yeah. Oh, shit. You got an Oscar? We got an Oscar winner in the house, man. Whoa. Tom. <laughs> Whiplash, the fucking drum movie where he smacks the kid a couple thousand times? The fucking movie's excellent. So what did you do? I was the sound mixer. So you mixed every one of those fucking slaps? Oh yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. What, um, number one, what a wonderful movie. Number two, um, were those, did you have to augment them or were those like his real slaps? He really hit them. Did he really? I mean, it, you know, not super hard, but... But enough for you to hear it? Yeah. And then you just dial that shit up? Put a yeah. little reverb on it? <laughs> Fucking A. So did you go up on stage? Oh, yeah. Captain America handed me my Oscar. What, what the fuck? Go stand in the spotlight, man! <laughs> so Chris Evans presented? Yep. No, uh, just for that award, yeah. For that, for the he presented for that award. Yeah. So you got up and he handed you a fucking Oscar. Totally. What What's, did you get to say in the time? Uh, I thank my crew. I was trying not to pass out. Fair. I mean, why? Well, because you were surprised, yeah, shocked. Yeah. Who were you up against? Interstellar, um, American Sniper. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, Whose dick did you suck to win that award? None. No wonder you were trying not to pass out. Yeah. That's stiff competition. What else was that? Um, I fr there was two others, and I'm um, blanking on them, sorry. Um, but uh, of those two alone, because yeah. I know the way Oscar voters fucking vote. Yeah. They just go, oh, I've heard of this movie, and they right. fucking go for that. And, and Interstellar, they're like, oh, that's expensive, yeah. and they vote for that and shit. They actually had to really fucking think in order to go like, you know what, man? The fucking sound design of that movie. And that is a movie that's all about... Yeah, music and drums. Music and, and drums, yeah, fucking A. Yeah. Um, what is, uh, what's his name? Um, Miles uh, Chazelle. Damien. Chazelle. Damien, what's he like? Oh, he's great. Good uh, kid. He's uh, probably the most well-prepared director I've ever worked for. It's what does that mean? Who are the other ones? Who are the least prepared um, directors? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> we just met. What does that met. mean? As a sound mixer, we actually had meetings. Like, uh, really? Yeah. So he'd want to talk about like what going into like, it, how to do it, what's going to work best. Um, you know, he he considered it an actual tool in the storytelling box. You know. Um, so when you get the award, did you you must have fucking thanked him, right? Well, um, we collectively did, and then I w um, well they tell us when we get nominated that only one person's allowed to speak, which totally doesn't happen, but. I just didn't want to be the guy that got play it off, so I was like trying to play it safe, and then I got three seconds at the end, and I thanked my crew. Fucking a man. Yeah. Good um, job. That what is it? What was it like? Like after that, when you went back, to, do you have to stay in your Backstage? seat for the rest of the night, or do you go? Well, it's a whirlwind. I mean, they brought us back to. There's like a camera where you say stuff that you forgot, and then they whisk you to like. Um, you know, there's like the foreign press, and then the video press, and then the radio press, and then. Like, um, you're walking around all kinds of hallways and like hyperventilating and <laughs> the rock walks by and you know, and, and then uh, all of a sudden I had like a glass of champagne and, um, and then like they don't let you go back to your seat until there's a commercial break. They have right. seat fillers. Um, so I had to like stand off in the wings for, you know, a couple of minutes until a commercial break happened and then they shove you back out. Who was the coolest person who congratulated you when you were backstage? Cause you're holding a fucking Oscar, yeah. right? 
Uh, well, Miles Teller was back there. He was getting ready for a little bit that they were doing, and so you know we hugged and jumped around. And, um, and, and well, do you walk away with a statue? Yeah. Does everybody on the crew get a statue? Um, yeah, well, everybody that wins. And um, it do, does it say your shit on it, or does that not come until later? afterwards? They put the, the governor's ball. They have like a plaque thing where they make them. So you go to the governor's ball with your Oscar, yeah. and you're like, can I get my name, please? Yeah. And they put it on the fucking statue? Yep. So you have to go to the fucking governor's ball? You do. And the black If you win only. See, yeah. that's why I don't want to win an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the party. <laughs> who wants to go to that fucking party? That's amazing, man. What yeah. was, who did you talk to first? Like, not in the room. Who's the first person you called? Uh, my father, because I, I was there with my mother. Oh my God, man, that is beautiful. How yeah. fucking proud was she? Uh, Thank God, I was yeah. gonna open with like, you must have got so late after you won that award that night. Well, I had to get rid of her first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that fucking rocks, man. Yeah. So what year was that? That's going back Th to- That was 2015. Um, do you get to up your price after that? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it makes it getting hired a lot easier too. That's right, right? Because yeah. you're like, oh, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> you just put it on the desk. Yeah. That fucking rocks, man. I'm so glad I opened the book, man. Give it up for Tom. Thank well you. Well done, Tom. <laughs> um, wow, man. Fucking. That's awesome. Yeah, how awesome is that? You never get to hear shit like that. No. Um, all right, where were we? Uh, Before Tom fucking rudely interrupted. Yeah, way to go, Tom. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of She-Hulk, Mark Ruffalo is in talks to appear in the She-Hulk TV show. I read that today. Which How is exciting cool. is that? This fucking Marvel uh, Universe TV shit they're doing at Disney Plus, it just sounds fantastic. It sounds like a dream fucking come true. They're literally just making longer movies and cutting them up into chapters. Yes, and spending all of the money on them to get fucking Ruffalo to show up for like a bit part as Bruce Banner to give a, a blood injection to his cousin. That's crazy. We Which live in that nice. world now. We live in that world. Um, but that's fucking awesome. I love the idea of it. And I love that people are still involved. I also saw an article where they are talking about Robert Downey Jr. is uh, talking about like, hey, I want to do something. But well, they're like, hey, you're pretty expensive. Yeah, but he's like, hey, but did you see Doolittle? And they're like, no. It's like, nobody did. Hey, can I do something? Oh, you think it's in relation to that? I mean, it doesn't hurt that he just had a massive global failure. Um, how massive? Uh, I, I don't have the precise numbers, but I think they spent somewhere upwards of about $200 million making that movie. Um, and, uh, and, and did not do well. I can be honest with you, though, man. If I'm in charge of the studio, who made that? Universal? Yeah. I'm in charge of Universal, and they're like, you want to make a 200 million fucking Robert Downey Jr. Talks to Animals movies? I'd be like, oh my, done and fucking done. Mm. Like, I would have bet on that. I can't even say, like, that's stupid. They've made that movie a bunch, and with him, you just imagine, like, it was going to kill. So that's oddly, yeah. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have seen that coming. I would have bet the farm on that movie. That being said, I didn't see it, so I'm part <laughs> of the problem. Yes. Literally, Universal did bet a farm on it full of animals, and nobody went. To go see. <laughs> yeah, nobody went. <laughs> they had to swallow that hit. Um, <clears throat> Taika Waititi. Oh, everybody is, uh, loves him. He's so creative. He's, he's so, and busier than fuck. Yeah. He is making Talented. two. He got an Oscar now, too. And he did. He got fucking Oscar. Yeah, he wanted shit. Yeah. Uh, he's making two cartoons for Netflix, both of which are coming out of the Willy Wonka universe. Oh, really? Yeah. He is making, so he's doing doll stuff? He's doing, yeah, he's doing a legit, like, just Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and then a separate Oompa Loompa movie. And they're animated? Yeah. Like, two oh, series. He's doing two series. Um, don't know the style of the animation yet. Um, I'm in. But yeah, he's working with the Roll Doll Story Company, which is the estate, and yeah, like, if anybody, if I want to see anybody make that kind of movie, I want to see him do that. I saw a tweet right before I came here today. They said, uh, if they're really looking to cast like Reed Richards as a guy who like has a million ideas at one time, they're like, they should look no further than this. And it was a picture of <laughs> Taika Waititi. And I was like, oh my God, that could totally fucking work. Yeah, like that's the dude who misses dinner because he's inventing in the lab. Yeah. Um, so I'm in for that, mm -hmm. man. 
Uh, what else you got? There's a, there seems to be a tidal wave of delays and rescheduling and cancellations because of the coronavirus. Yeah. Um, and the James Bond movie that was supposed to open in like three weeks is now pushing to Thanksgiving. Yeah, well, he just did the episode, last week's episode of SNL, but yeah. I, and I imagine that was in yeah, promotion of James Bond, but mm -hmm. there's no James Bond to promote. No. Um, they said they're gonna like, lose like 30 million moving the movie. I mean, because they spend a fucking ton marketing it now, and they have to market it again in November, right. and all that money is gone. But you know, it's just the beginning of what is maybe going to be for the next few months until everybody's a handle on it, shit going away that we were looking forward to. South by Southwest is canceled. Coachella is pushing to October, I think. Right. Um, WonderCon is in a month. Like, what happens to that? What happens to Comic-Con in July? Um, yeah, Emerald City, City Comic Con canceled. That was uh, that made me think that once that happened, South by Southwest wasn't far behind. But at least the Emerald City Comic Con made a lot of sense because there's cases in Seattle. The Austin one, that was the city of Austin going. We're calling it right now. Yeah, you know, and there's there's a very good chance that they cancel the Olympics. What do you think happens to? How deep does this go? Like, does Comic Con still happen? It's a fine question. I mean, because you want to talk about putting a bunch of fucking people in a tight space, sweaty, yeah. bodies, coughing, fucking touching, rubbing. rubbing. <laughs> that that's an event. Cannes Film Festival as well. Yeah, is coming up. They're gonna make some decisions soon. You know, and then the sporting events where there are balls or pucks thrown around. Like, you're about to get into the Final Four, you're about to get into football season, you're about to get into the things that America seems to do a lot, which is gather a bunch of people in spaces that are somewhat confined with bad circulation. It's so weird, I'm so myopic, I forgot, like, oh my God, sports. Like, there's a bunch of people get together and like watch sports, like yeah. football games, don't they have like tens of thousands of people? Yeah, I mean, college football, you can have like 80, 90,000 people in the stands. Uh, and the Olympics, it's a billion dollar investment in Japan and not to say that the dollar sign is the only thing that's interesting or, or, or noteworthy about it, but Japan is the only other place, the only other time an Olympics has been canceled was also in Japan. For what? World War II. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, would, you, you would brought the room down. We're all like, oh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Sorry, gang. Oh, that yeah, happened. 1940. <laughs> um, all right. So are you glad you're off tour? I mean, I am glad that we're fin we finished the tour because it would have been much harder to sell tickets in a world where people are like, I don't want to get coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But um, I feel bad for, like we had a movie at South by Southwest. My friend Malcolm Ingram directed a movie about me, a documentary called The Clerk. And I was kind of looking forward to, it, to you know, seeing it and stuff, but I'll see it someplace else. A bunch of filmmakers, and Malcolm's been to that festival before and he's made a bunch of movies. A bunch of first-time filmmakers that were like, we got into South by Southwest, this is the beginning and shit. And now it's just done. And it's not like, oh, we're doing it three months later. They're just not doing it. So 2020 doesn't happen. Yeah. And so all those people, and that's just the film side. But then you got bands that were coming out there and built a whole tour around kicking off at South by and moving on. So it's, it's I mean, it makes sense what they did, but it's, you know, kind of heartbreaking, like all the way down. Never mind the people who had their hopes pinned to the event, then there are people who live off the events, like all the service industry mm -hmm. folks and stuff like that. Bunch of restaurants in Austin probably sitting on a fuck ton of product that they thought that they were gonna be moving, mm -hmm. and now they're, they're not moving it. So if you're in the Austin area, go out to eat, man. I'm surprised that like Netflix hasn't stepped in and says, you know what, we're gonna do a virtual South by Southwest. Like every movie that was supposed to screen, we will screen. We will put Indie it up on Wire the announced that they're going to review all the movies regardless. Yeah. I thought that was nice. But like, let let people see them, and maybe find a way to charge extra so that the people who were out money at the at the actual festival can somehow get a piece of that back. Mm. But it seems as if that's a thing you can solve. If Coachella can broadcast the entirety of a weekend online, and you can watch Beyonce slay then why can't you actually do the same thing with a film festival? Find ways to do the Q&As afterwards and have them all be virtual and have, you wanna have a crowd you know, Q&A session? Fucking get in a queue and it's like fucking Twitch, but for a festival. The only problem then though is if you, you've got a film that you're selling at a festival and stuff and you just put it out online, you don't have a film to sell anymore, the internet owns it. Once it's digital, it's out of your hands. Like a performance at Coachella, 
they'll go perform that song a couple thousand times in a bunch of different places and stuff, but the movie, you're like, all we have is the movie. If we give the movie away, we're fucked. That's the only reason why they wouldn't do it. I would imagine. Think yeah. about it, because no festival, I mean, generally they have some movies like, you know, kind of retrospective screenings, but 95, 98% of your movies are, here's shit you've never seen. And if you've never seen the shit before and they're just debuting it online, anybody with a computer now has that shit and you don't have any more shit to sell. Yeah, I mean, but there are also, like as a previous member of the press, you get screening links for shit all the time. Yeah, and that's um, how those fucking movies get out. Jay and Silent Bob Reboot fucking got out through a review link. Yeah. From, from Universal. We kept it very tight on the American side. Universal had it internationally. They gave out a link for screening, and boop, it was suddenly online and stuff. So, yeah, once it's digital, give it up. It's like telling somebody a secret. Once you do it, assume everyone's going to fucking know. So I, I like your vision, but it goes against... Uh, Common sense. Man, you know, it's a hard pill to swallow. <laughs> it's very hopeful. Uh, very what hopeful. else you got? Uh, they are, at, again, the Disney Plus making a Beauty and the Beast prequel series. Is this the one everyone was mad about two months ago? Uh, I don't think it's two months old. I think it was just like three days ago. The news oh, came. no, it's Aladdin. Remember Aladdin? They were yeah. going to do a spin off show with the one white with guy in Aladdin, and everyone's <laughs> like, that's a bad fucking look. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Um, uh, this wait, this a, ain't that. This is Gaston and LeFou are getting their own show. Josh Gad was LeFou. And Luke Evans was Gaston. Um, oh, and they're and, getting their own show? They're getting their own show. Josh Gad is, is show running it, I believe. He's, He's show team. running it? Yeah. Are they a couple? They should be a couple. <laughs> because That's a hot show they're right there. crazy gay for each other. I know, right? <laughs> if that's the show, they got a hit on their hands. Fuck yes. Um, wow, so they're, they are spending all the fucking money. So much money. You know so what? We all win. Like, some cool shit's gonna happen because of it. I mean, I'm not in for that show, but they, you know, they, they do, do another shit that they're gonna have me for. Mm. Um, you watched the Chernobyl show, right? I did not. You didn't watch fucking Chernobyl? I, I watched the first episode and it was pretty depressing and then I stopped. Yeah, but that's how it works, though. Yeah. Like, it's so depressing, it makes you feel better about your own life. It's, it's like a blues song. It didn't have that effect on me. I, I, I understand it won awards and people love it and stuff, but I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a sunny side of the street kind of guy. <laughs> Tune in to Swallow, you guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like my shit where people eat fucked up shit. Not because, like, nuclear radiation tells them to, no. because they're bored housewives. <laughs> Just dig it the most. Uh, I have not. Well, I did watch the first episode, and then I didn't watch the rest. Uh, the guy who, uh, who created it and wrote every episode of it, Craig Mazin, um, is an avowed video game fan, uh -huh. as am I. And his next project, after winning like nine Emmys for Chernobyl, is an adaptation of the game Last of Us. Um, which is I don't maybe... know. I just made a face like, oh, I don't know what the fuck that is. Ah. What is that? That's a video game? It's a video game. It is I was just stuck on, Craig Mazin won a bunch of Emmys? Yeah. For that Chernobyl thing? Uh huh. Craig Mason also, he did one of the scary movies. He did. He I think was, like Scary Movie 5. He did a bunch of them. Did he really? He wrote like, um, that's the inspiring. Hangover 2 and 3. Well, I mean, but those made fucking money. They did. Stuff. But he was in the, the Miramax. He also made that. Camp also. He was. He was a Bob Weinstein kid. Um, he did that uh, superhero movie, like the spoof movie with right, yeah. whatever it was called. It might have been a superhero movie after I think it was. Was it a superhero movie? Yeah. Um, yeah. He wrote Chernobyl and then won a bunch of Emmys? Yeah. That ought to fucking teach everybody out there, like, it don't matter what you do. One day you could be doing the fucking superhero spoof movie, and the next day you could be winning Emmys and then doing a video game show I've yeah. never heard of. What um, is the property? The, the Last of Us. Um, this game came out about seven years ago, and it's gorgeous. It is one of my favorite games ever. Um, not because the gameplay is amazing or whatever, but What is the plot? The plot is uh, Zombie Apocalypse. Um, oh, oh, do that's tell. A, that's original. And uh, and there's a, a young woman. She's like 13, 14 years old, who happens to be immune to to the zombie virus. And so she has to be ferried from one side of wherever to the other side of wherever. And in order to do that, there's this guy named Joel who turns out to be her sort of guardian angel slash you know bodyguard slash surrogate father figure. And it's all about the relationship that these two people who hated each other at the beginning of the game develop and bond and fuse by the end of the game. Sounds like a TV show. Very much so. Um, but it is one of the very few games I've ever played where by the end of it, I cried because the, the 
what happens over the course of this game, the, the evolution of their relationship, the events that challenge that relationship and, and push them to the edge of, of reality and, and heart and health and all of that shit. Um, it's devastating by the time it ends in a way that's wonderful and have never felt that way in a game and then played it again just to feel that thing again. And How long does it take to play? The 25, 30 hours. I think. And you've done it twice? I've done it twice. Will you watch the show? Because you've lived it. <laughs> Absolutely. No, um, wow. So That's high praise. It's very good. And so very exciting that it's going to be on HBO. Um, they're investing in it the way they invested in Watchmen, the way they invest in Westworld, which is it's a big fucking show. Spending money. Spending money. And it's got a kid lead? Um, yeah, I mean, basically it's... It's a lone wolf cubby kind of thing? We gotta get lone this kid cubby, from here? She's a little older than... You I'm know. sorry, lone wolf cubby. It's a Mandalorian kind of thing? We gotta get this kid from here to here? Yeah, she is not nearly as cute as, uh, as uh, the baby Well, is. they haven't cast yet. You don't know. Don't know. She's not gonna have those eyes. Um, that's, um, <laughs> that's a show uh, worth looking out for, you're saying? Uh, yeah, done I'm excited. It's super early development. It could take years and years, but the fact that it's coming makes me very happy. Fucking A. Um, and that, my friend, is all the news we have. That's all the news? That's all the news. That last thing is Max Foncino. Give it up for Mark. He brought you the news. <laughs> Woo! News, 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 news. Ah, we haven't done all the news. I think there's one last story to do, Mark. What have you, you know? seen the pictures of Kumail? Holy shit. Oh I want to fuck Kumail, man. Like, oh my God. He just, so Kumail got in uh, uh, shape for the Eternals. Yeah. And um, since he was fucking in gorgeous shape, Men's Journal did a photo shoot with him where he reenacted famous movie scenes where dudes were shirtless and shit. And he played Wolverine and looked incredibly fucking convincing. <laughs> he played um, Patrick Bateman from American Psycho, Skip and wow. Rope. He played, um, was it Top Gun? It was, <laughs> what? John McClane. John McClane. In the elevator shaft. And I think, and one of them was, I think yeah. it was Top Gun, right? Pete Mitchell, he's playing, the volleyball. He's playing volleyball. My God, he like, he looks incredible. In, he looks like an action figure. I mean, if I got and into it, that shape, it's never gonna happen, but if I did, I would take all the pictures also. I mean, it was a smart fucking thing to do. And he's been like talking about how he lost the weight and shit. Like I read one headline was like, he didn't eat brownies for a year. And I was like, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do that. Um, but if Marvel's paying you enough and like fucking like giving you the high tech trainer and shit, yeah. like why and not that's use your it? job? Like, like he you're... Chris Pratted himself. Yeah. Like that's crazy, man. Like it might go from, like, oh, we all know who Kamel is to like, we had no idea. And he may be like the next Chris Pratt, like getting fucking leading man roles and shit. Mm -hmm. And not leading man roles because like, oh, he's funny. Leading man roles because like, take your fucking shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> You're sexy now. Yeah. Um, all right, so we did all the news. Now that we've done Kamel, that's all the news. That's um, all the news. Now we uh, get to the part of the show, ladies and gentlemen, where we do Q&A. We open uh, the Q&A uh, questions up to the audience uh, and then share with you Fabulous fucking prizes, man. And this week, um, we've got two. Oh, that too? Yeah. And okay. All right, so, yeah? Yeah. Because sure. we already got that. We got that, but let's make it a, a comeback show, man. You want to sweeten the pot? Let's fucking, oh, yeah. Fair enough. So what we've got is uh, four, then if I'm correct, prizes. Unless you want to hold this till next week. Do we have four prizes? I guess we Well, have we had prizes. two tickets, and then... Yeah, oh, no, wait, two tickets? One set, of two? one set of two. All right, so now we got three things to give away. Sorry, kids, basic math. Um, <laughs> We're getting there. We have three things to give away. Uh, one, we have a set of tickets. Uh, our good friend uh, Brett Deacon gave us uh, tickets to, uh, two tickets to 40X. Is mm -hmm. that correct? A 40X screening? Uh, I've been singing the praises of 40X for a long time, kids. Um, uh, the easiest way for me to say it is it's like going to a movie that's also a roller coaster that ch just comes this shy of blowing you. That's how I like satisfying the whole 40X experience is. You've seen a 40X movie? I have indeed. I've seen a 40X movie. I can barely swallow. It's crazy. It's definitely wor worth checking out a big, expensive movie. You wouldn't check out something like Jane Silent Bob reboot in 40X. Mm. 
because who knows what they'd throw in your face. But a Marvel movie? Hell yeah. That's what you want to see. Black Widow? Hell yeah. Which is coming up, Black Widow, man. Speaking of which, we didn't talk about that. What do you think of the new trailer? Uh, the new trailer is the first trailer that really made me want to see Black Widow. Some of that Taskmaster Some shit? Some of that Taskmaster shit. That's, yeah, that really brought me in. Yeah. I was just like, oh, that's tight. And then there's a photo that they've been putting online, I guess it is a trailer shot, of him watching the overhead camera shot from Iron Man 2 when they introduce Black Widow and she breaks mm. into Hammer Corp and just starts fucking kicking ass, they show him watching that. And I was like, oh, that's a good callback. I look mm. forward to that. Um, okay, so we've got a f set of 40X tickets. Um, we also have uh, right here um, this gorgeous, why are we giving this away? I'll take this shit. <laughs> um, Batman, the definitive history of the Dark Knight in comics, film, and beyond, published by the good folks at Insight Editions. Man, this book is thick as a dick and will kill somebody. <laughs> um, it's perfect for the bathroom. A lifetime it would take you to get through this. Perfect for a coffee table. It's a classy fucking uh, prize. And then uh, thir another third of our three prizes, Mark brought in here. Tell them what it is. Yeah, Mark. that is a download code for Final Draft 11. Um, if you are an aspiring screenwriter, um, this, is the, this is the Bible. This is the tool. This is your Rosetta Stone. This is also crazy fucking expensive. Um, and I'm not saying it just because it is, but it is. And it's, it's like the barrier for entry if you want to be a professional screenwriter. Every TV show, every movie gets written in this program or at some point gets converted into this program because it is how the industry runs. The journey of a million mile, miles begins with final draft. Yes. Um, and if you've ever been sitting out there going, maybe I want to be a writer or just look like one, you can have your chance tonight if you win this. Uh, its cash value is pretty high, right? About 200 bucks. $200 cash value, that's fucking sweet. Um, and with each winning uh, package, of course, you're gonna get this week's beautiful art created by uh, the great Nate himself, Dark Nate Returns. Look at that, some gorgeous shit. I've been begging JC forever, uh, the, the proprietor of this here joint, the, the Scum and Villainy Cantina, to take all of Nate's posters and poster the bathroom with them, man. It'd be a cool <laughs> thing to do. And now that I've said it publicly, we've shamed him into doing so. Um, JC uh, picks the people who are going to ask the questions, so we turn it over to you, uh, JC. What, what do we got? All right. I forgot to mention this before the show started, but I got this letter from somebody back in November. Um, so that'll be the first Q&A. Uh, I'm going to try to go through it because it's a long letter, um, and it didn't have anthrax in it, so I figured we could do it. Uh, he says, Dear JC, my name is Justin Daisy. Included is a letter from Mr. Smith and Mark Bernardin. I'm far too poor to travel all the way to LA to ask my question, but it's something I desperately have been wanting to ask since my dad passed in March. Oh. Uh, please give the included letter for them to read on the podcast q and I'm very appreciative. And then he sent me $2 cash. <laughs> wow. To do what with? Yeah, really. To bribe me to read this letter. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know it's not a buck for each of us? <laughs> I want it my two dollars. Uh, <laughs> I include what little cash I have as compensation for this. And it's American so, cash? Yeah, it's two, he's from Iowa. Oh, I thought he was from England. Uh, Iowa? But, and he only said two bucks? Well, he's a mailman, so he, he finds it ironic that he's not delivering this in person. Oh, <laughs> That's but uh, the letter was kind of sweet, so I'm going to try to Fire try away. to get through it here. Uh, if you're reading this, I'm very surprised. Thank you, JC. My name is Justin Daisy from Ames, Iowa, that state that you fly over. I wish I could come to a live show, but as a mailman, I don't make that good of scratch to come out there. My father, my father passed in March 2019 from a random heart attack. Ugh. His name is Don Daisy. He and I had our differences and are very different people, but we did share a love of all things DC and Batman. His first tattoo was of the Batman animated series logo. His mother cried for hours, I was told. Yeah. And my first one was of the Batman Beyond logo. Circle of life, huh? Uh, like I said, we didn't see eye to eye on a lot, but when I went off to college, life got better. We did talk, and we both tried to connect with each other. I don't know how it came up, but he found out I listened to this podcast 
And while he didn't understand, he did recognize who Kevin Smith was. So for the last few years, we would chat about uh, Kevin Smith movies and news. Mm. Uh, then uh, he sa uh, his question is, what is something your father taught you that you still hold on to or appreciate to this day? And or what is something you hope to pass on to your children? And that's for both of you guys. Uh, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can go first. Um, my dad taught me somewhat inadvertently um, that writing was a job persons can have. I went to go see Flash Gordon at nine years old in the theater, mm -hmm. starring one, Max von Sydow. And, uh, and there's the moment in Flash Gordon where, if you're not familiar with it, they're on the planet Arbor, right? And like Flash is kind of in disguise, and Prince Baron's like, oh, I hate you because I think Aura is all about you. And he's like, well, I'm going to rope you in with these other young knuckleheads who are going to pass the trial of manhood and become a full-bledged Arborian citizen. And they have the great stump in the middle of this fucking uh, veranda, I guess, on the planet Arbor, and the whole jizz was, jizz, weird. The whole, <laughs> the gist, the, the gist was, uh, you know, the young guys would stick their hands in the stump, and inside the stump there was this weird scorpion thing that would have, uh, would bite you, and you had to stick your hand in, leave it in there long enough. If the scorpion decided that you were worthy and didn't bite you, you could be a man, and if it did, the poison was lethal and you would die in mere minutes. That's pretty much the jizz. Pretty much the jizz. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, you see one young guy do it, you see him get bitten, so you establish the, the, the rules, and then Flash sticks his hand in. And I, at nine years old, I'm on the edge of my fucking seat. I'm like, oh, what the fuck is about to happen here? I just saw a motherfucker die, and your hero sticking his hand in? I'm like, no, don't kill Flash Gordon! And my, my dad leans over and goes, uh, don't worry, they never kill the hero. And I was like, who's this they shit? <laughs> I didn't know there was a day that, like, wait, this isn't, the, movies just don't appear in the world, They're, they are made by people, like, everything that you watch on TV is the, is the fault of a bunch of people who made something, and that was literally the first time that I realized that this was a job people had, and it was mm. a thing that you do, and that lots of people did. And, and lots of people did different things. And then one of them was writer. And they're the people who never kill the hero until they do, in which case it's awesome. So that is the thing <laughs> that, uh, that my dad taught me. Not on purpose. It wasn't like it comes sit on my knee and let me expose the wisdom right. of the universe. But he did somehow also crack open the, the cheat code of the universe for me. So yeah. And then the uh, advice that you would pass on as a parent. Uh, the advice I would hope to pass on as a parent. Is that what it was? I, I thought it was Andor, but I'll, yeah. Andor. Uh, we'll do the and. Um, stay curious, you know, like the, the, the peril of adulthood is being stagnant. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's stopping to wonder why things work the way they work. Why, how things happen, what more you can learn. I remember watching an interview with Harrison Ford, I think it was on Letterman, and uh, A, he had the earring, which is dumb, but <laughs> he had also just learned to fly. And he was like 72 years old. And Dave was like, why? And Harrison just said, I had to learn something new in a while. And I wanted to learn something new. And he decided to learn how to fly. Smart. And, and just the, that keeping yourself curious about the world and looking to learn new things and looking to expose yourself to shit you haven't ever before. Traveling, meeting people, not being afraid, being curious, like curiosity. Is, is ultimately what drives sort of ambition. It's what drives, uh, it's what drives. And so do that. Very nice. Um, I, uh, my, the advice, I didn't get advice from my dad, um, but uh, what I got from my dad, same thing, um, was inadvertent. Um, however, made all the difference. I am uh, my father's child, and I am why I am and who I am today because of him and not because he tried to shape that, just because I got to witness his life. And he was the first adult that I knew, right? Him and mom. So they represented what it was going to be to grow up one day. That was the prime example I saw every fucking day. We had other people, other adults in my life, but there it was. And my old man hated his fucking job. Hated it with a passion. He worked at the post office and he worked at nights. So he worked, uh, he'd leave the house at 10 o'clock at night, start shift at 11 o'clock, work till seven in the morning, and then come home after that and stuff. And he hated his fucking job with a passion. I've never seen anyone dislike 
a function more than that. Like, you know, he did it because that's what paid for his family and shit, but he wasn't from a generation that was like, what were your ambitions? What do you dream about doing? He dreamed about having a wife and kids and he just had to pay for it. And so he got a fucking job and he couldn't stand it. Every night of his life that he had to work, he did not want to go to work and shit. Um, he was not a generally unhappy man, but at night, he was cranky as fuck, man. And when I saw him, his most relaxed and his most joyous, other than when I'm sure my mother fucked him, because I didn't see that, but, <laughs> but I'm here, so I'm proof that it happened at least fucking once. Um, I it was in a movie theater, and he would take me to the movies all the time, because that's what he did with me. Like, at one point, he had a conversation with my mom. He was like, I'm going to do movies with the fat one. That's going to be our thing and shit. And then he would take me to the movies all the time. And in the movies, he was happy. Like, you know, he'd escape. They, this is exactly what they're there for. It's like that scene from Sullivan's Travels. He was a fucking prisoner with a sour puss on until the movie began, and then he was fucking happy and shit like that. And it was never him going, you should do this, because we didn't come from that fucking world. But that left an impact. Two, two things that I still, to this day, believe in. Like, fucking movies can save a life not physically, but they can save your sanity. And um, don't ever get a fucking job, ever. And so I've endeavored to not get a job my whole fucking life, and in doing so, just made a bunch of fucking movies. So he, I don't know if he ever marked the irony before he fucking died, but like I told him at one point, I was like, you know, I do this because you used to take me to the movies. And he goes, I didn't take you to the movies like the kind you make. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a point of pride to a point and shit. Um, what advice would I give my kid? Um, I've, you know, I've given her every piece of advice. Unlike my father, I tried to shape my kid's existence by giving her fucking lessons and shit like that. Mercifully, she chose like her own path and stuff. But the one piece of advice I always thought was really useful was um, it came later in life uh, when she wanted to be an actress, and that's what she is now. But. Um, you know, she, she wound up getting in Quentin's movie and she was so fucking over the moon about it and shit. And I was like, that's great. And, and I'm so happy for you because you really wanted this. But, you know, um, like the reason she got cast was because uh, he had the Manson kids come up with their own monologues. He didn't give them pages to audition with. He was just like, come up with what you think your character would say. So she did a monologue that she wrote, and he fucking liked it, and cast her. He was like, you know, I like her monologue. I'm going to find something for her. I'm going to write a part for her. And so, you know, she was, like, over the moon because she got picked. And I was like, I get it. That's what every actor or actress lives for, that moment where you are the one out of 200 fucking people. You got picked. That's great. But what I heard in that story was one of the greatest writers in our business responded to something you fucking wrote. You wrote that monologue, and that's what got you fucking hired and stuff. So lean into that. Like, fucking write a script, direct it yourself, because, like, yes, it's nice to get picked by somebody else, but, you know, you didn't fall far from this fucking tree, man, as an apple. And if I had waited for somebody to pick me, you wouldn't be fucking born. I'd still be at a convenience store in New Jersey, man. So it's nice to get picked, but don't fucking spend your whole life waiting for somebody to pick you. Pick your fucking self, man. And so she started writing a script. I felt really good about that. Hopefully she'll write herself a leading part and she'll direct the fucking thing, man. So that, that's, that was the best piece of advice that I, as the guy that I became in life, could pass on to her, man, which was like, fucking don't wait. You, there's no waiting. No one is ever coming to help. And just because you're good at something doesn't mean you'll necessarily be rewarded with the fucking job. So it's fun to go through the process. I would imagine, I don't know why any actor or actress would ever subject themselves to constant like auditions. Just hearing no over and over again would be soul crushing to me. That's why I did what I did. Not because I'm like, I was visionary. I was just like, well, I would never get picked by anybody else. So I'm gonna fucking pick myself and chart my own fucking course. So that's what I'd tell her, pick yourself. Um, all right, that's to the person that's not here, so they don't get anything. No. They don't get anything. <clears throat> Before uh, we dive into the questions, somebody explain this. Who brought the bags with the books? Uh, you explain. Uh, we just, uh, I love these. I've seen these before. I'm going to hold them up. This I got once years ago at um, the Opera House. Hollywood Babylon, I no, think. No, you got it in Sydney at the Opera House. Where was it? Sydney, Australia. 
At the Opera House? At the Opera House. Yeah. But it wasn't, I wasn't there with Babylon. It was there just me by myself. For some just reason, there, I you, associated you and Jay with were there. It's amazing. It's called Wookie Erotica. And it's, oh my. it is a magazine, like, it, it's, it's unbelievable. It's a Star Wars parody magazine is what it builds itself as. But it is so fucking authentic that I was like, this is a real fucking thing. And he was like, no, it says parody right on it. On the back, there's like a Smirnoff ad, but it's Smirhoff. And it has the Wookiee's arm cut off, holding a bottle of vodka. It is beyond fucking brilliant. This one I've seen, and there's there's also some. There's, it's Wookie erotica, so there's not a, just. Yes, there's a lady here. Hold on, I, I got to show you this. And you know, fucking for for people who might get easily offended. Uh, oh my! Avert your eyes. There's a woman with a Gamorrean guard mask on. So it's like a sexy Gamorrean guard from Return of the Jedi. Well, dude, it's so brilliant. There's like some some naked layers. There's shit also in here. boobies in it as well. But it's like Playboy as if it was in yeah, the Star Wars universe. So basically, it's the idea if it was uh, if Playboy existed in uh, 1970s Playboy existed in the Star Wars universe. And if I remember correctly, like why did you do it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It but was it wasn't like things. you were hired. You were like, I no, think no, no. this would be cool. Every, everything we gave you tonight, like that was made by me and uh, Craig, him, my business partner, just because we wanted to do it. We, just to do it. Yeah, That's we just made so our charming. own versions, like Mark said earlier, just to do a different take on stuff you're familiar with. This one I haven't seen. No, uh, that... That one I wanted to bring. Uh, that's the latest one. That's the sequel. The latest. It's Woogie Rodica, and it shows R2-D2 lighting the cigarette of... <laughs> of a lady who's, you know, clear. It looks exactly like a Playboy. It's so fucking wonderful. Yeah, a lot of it, we've actually recreated the original font from the 70s and all the ads and everything, but everything's uh, wow. Star Wars inspired. That one, we had to go a bit deeper because we only referenced the original kind of trilogy, so there's like, a lot of there's stuff. There's an ad for a, light, uh, uh, the, a land speeder that looks fucking <laughs> astounding, man. It's really Part great. It's awesome. Really great. Um, what is now? This is new. What is Saber? Oh, of course we made that, and uh, we have a lot of female fans who like our stuff. So we made a male pinup it's, it's calendar called Saber. What is it? I'm sorry. It's a male pinup calendar for our female fans. Uh, so it's cheesecake for the ladies. Yeah. This is tremendous. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Um, we'll go to another random one. Let's see. Part He's, of me wants to like... A lot of dudes holding lightsabers very suggestively. <laughs> um, oh my God. But what, what is it called? The name of it is Giant... Giant Panda King's our company. Is your company. But again, you do it for fun? Yeah, we just do it for fun. We do sell them, but most of it's <laughs> fun just for fun. Because we're just... Uh, do, wait, you do sell them? Yeah, we do sell them on our website, but yeah, we do, do a people, lot for fun. Like, please tell me everyone buys them. Yeah, they do. They do, good. Yeah. Because it, when I first saw it, I was like, this is ingenious. But it was described to me as a one-off. I didn't know that you actually sold it. Was this is a... in my library at home. I pass this literally every day. Oh, good. This is the unauthorized detailed account of Gotham, 1919 to 1939. And it's a bunch of photos that you guys had to create Everything in that book we created. You created everything. And yeah. so it's basically like, it's, it's crazy. I opened this book and I was like, this looks so expensive. The Batmobile, an old style Batmobile, you guys had to create that shit? Yeah, that was, uh, that was that of a miniature. So we basically wanted to retell the whole canon of Batman between the two world wars and combine real history with Batman. And Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Everybody has a page and they're represented... Yeah, a bit as of, they would be. The big kick for us was taking like characters like Batmite and Tweedledum and Tweedledee and trying to make them realistic in a 1920 setting. And this, you could sell this. This folks can buy this as well. Yep. It's Where do they go? Giantpandaking.com. Giantpandaking.com. I, I vouch for this shit. I've seen it in person, and it is gobsmackingly excellent. Done Thank with you. incredible affection and attention to detail. Wow. Um, for that. I, this is crazy, man. When I looked in the bag, I was like. <gasps> What brings you to town? Um, basically, uh, we, got, uh, we have to head off to Vegas in a couple of days. We've got to meet a few meetings there for a 
um, project we're working on. But um, every time we're in town, if the show's on, we always try and make it. And since the early days of uh, Fat Man on Batman and then Fat Man Beyond, I've always wanted to... When I used to listen to the show and it used to be the old format, I always thought, oh, one day I'm going to get Kevin to talk about the book. I'm going to get Kevin to talk about the book. So it was kind of a full circle thing for It me. really is. What a self-fulfilling prophecy, man. Excellent fucking job. Thank you. Give it up for him, man. It's fantastic stuff. Part, part of me really wants to take those Wookiee magazines and, like, drop them in the woods somewhere. <laughs> So like some enterprising young child, because that's how everybody else found their porn when you're like 11 years old. It's like, did you find us like a Playboys in the woods? Like, yeah, let's go back to the woods. <laughs> and now like, A, they don't have Playboys, and B, like we're scarce on woods. But like it would be kind of nice just to like, we're going to create some nerds and some men. Also, <laughs> today. also see kids find porn at age six on the internet at this point, so they won't have to stumble over like, it in the what woods. What is this artifact of a bygone age? <laughs> It is, just leave it, buy it and leave it at a doctor's office. <laughs> it would be such a mind fuck. People would be like, is this from another dimension? Is this real? What is this? When I was looking at it, I was like, is this a real fucking thing? Even though it said parody on it, it was so well done. Um, all right, where are we going? JC's picking people. We got three people to go. We got Danny Radford. Danny? Give it up for Danny, man. Yay! Danny's first. All right, Danny. How are you? I'm stoked. I'm, I'm from Australia. I'm just stoked to be so here. So is he! I know. Do and you guys know each other? Makes me really proud to be an Australian. Wow. <laughs> what part are you from? I'm from Brisbane. Where are you from? Sydney? Sydney. Brisbane. And though, how far? You guys are way far apart. That's 12 hours drive. Right on. So not friends then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's what I always sure. thought. Did you come solo? What are you doing out here? Yeah, I'm here solo. I've just been in uh, Canada for the last couple of weeks snowboarding and just got to LA last night. The whole time I was in Canada, all I could think about was your Emo Kev episodes <laughs> yes. and your imitations of the Canadians, yes. eh? And was, was I uh, accurate? Oh, it was fucking great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm a massive Star Wars fan and I'm a massive Mandalorian fan. And uh, I think Favreau's the, the right guy to be working on that. It just... It feels like it's coming from his heart. And when I hear you, Mark, talk about story and the way you break down story, sometimes you criticise Star Wars a little too much for me. But, <laughs> and but, that's why I'm here tonight. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, holy shit. Oh, I'm the Ayatollah of rock and roll. <laughs> I've been travelling. I brought the corona, yeah. Um, I would love to know what you guys would do, how you would break a story for a Star Wars TV show and who you'd cast in it. Ooh. Mm. Any Star Wars TV show. That's not about Mando! My friend Mando! You're the secret of fella, I'm gonna shout your name in the bar. Mando! <laughs> he did that a lot. A bunch. <laughs> uh, fuck. A Star Wars show. Um, Look, if we want the show to make money, just call it Baby Yoda and fucking <laughs> feature a show on him. But they've already got that gimmick going. I, uh, I, was, I was quite taken with, uh, with Cara Dune as a character. And I could, I could see like who? Um, the Gia Carano, the, the super oh, in, formal in, in, uh, uh, rebel shock trooper. Um, I could see more stories with her. I could see her origin story. I, can, I think she's so fucking badass that I would watch a show about that character. Um, and the things that that character has gone through to get to where she is, the, the level of disillusionment. Like you've got to believe at some point to enlist in that squadron. You know, and then to have that belief somehow hammered away from you and leave her the way she is now. Um, and then, I mean, The Mandalorian seems to be partly at least about her arc towards believing in something again. Um, maybe that something is Mando, maybe it's Baby Yoda, maybe it's whatever. But that, that loss of faith, I think, is super interesting, um, especially in a, in a show, in a saga that is fundamentally kind of about faith, you know, and what happens when it's taken from you. And who do you choose to hate for it? And that person is probably yourself to a certain degree. Um, so yeah, I'd watch that show if they'd pay me money for it. Nice. Uh, I would go uh, less obscure. I would just do a flat-out Darth Vader show, but Darth Vader the early years. So he's in the suit. He's figuring out how to be a Lord of the Sith. It's all the early stuff. Like um, somewhere between uh, the end of um, what was the last one where he became. Revenge of the Sith, but before he becomes 
like the badass from the Rogue One hallway scene? How does he become that badass? Um, that to me is no brainer because, you know, fucking it's a dude in a mask, like just like Mandalorian. He never takes that mask off, so pretty easy show to shoot. Um, <laughs> I would, I would do that because, you know, fucking he's key character and even though he's like, everybody thinks they know him, they haven't really even scratched the fucking surface. Um, he's only truly been in a couple fl films, so you can really go deep down a, a well with him, I think. Um, and there was a thing I saw recently online, I don't read the uh, Star Wars comic books, but I guess in some recent one or some part of canon is that the Sand People, the Tusken Raiders, worship Darth Vader. They did this in a comic. There's a gorgeous splash page of this giant like Darth Vader statue and all the Tusken Raiders bowing in front of it. And what I thought was metal as fuck about that was that they don't know that fucking he was Anakin Skywalker, the guy that came in and fucking slaughtered all the Tusken Raiders. Yeah, the kids as well. Um, so I, I thought that was a cool So You could do that like as one of the stories and shit. Like, because this is a guy who's descending slowly into controlled madness, right? Like losing his humanity. Physically, he's lost his humanity. He's encased in fucking metal. I don't know, something interesting to do there. I mean, he is one of the most fucking recognizable villains of all time, but like you could spend a lot. I mean, look, we just did a whole deep dive on Joker for two hours. Motherfucker won an Oscar and it made a billion dollars. I'm sure we can fucking find some shoe leather on Darth Vader <laughs> to fucking put together and do the same thing. Um, that's fucking dope. Yeah, did we I answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah. You have won a Thank prize, you. man. Give it up for him. You get to pick. You want tickets, you want final draft, or you want the book? The Batman, Batman book? book? Poster well in the Batman book? All yours, man. Well done. Pleasure, man. Welcome. Oh, thank you. It's heavy. That question fucking yielded a great story. Sadly, nobody at home is going to see it. But, no. <laughs> but what a great story. I look again. forward to that. Fuck, that's awesome. All right, JC. Fuck, that was good. That was real good, man. Yay. Brian Wolf. See, that could be on my fucking show. See? Yes. There you go. Sweet episode. The one everyone would talk about. Who are we going with? Brian, Brian Wolf. Wolf. Give it up for Brian, everybody. <laughs> oh, it's the wipe down. What's up, Bri? Hey, how you doing? So good. Where are you from? Uh, Philadelphia originally. Been here for the last two years. Right okay. on, man. Yeah. <laughs> Shine sweet freedom. Shine the light on me. Right, Michael so McDonald, man. That fucking song was about the Liberty Bell. Is it really? Yeah. Sweet freedom? Yeah. The song from Running Scared? Yeah. Is it about the Liberty Bell? You never know it, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that until then. Follow that. Yeah, good right. luck. Uh, I have no idea. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, my question is, if you guys could choose one item from any comic book universe, can't be like the Mother Box or like the Infinity Gauntlet, but from any hero, which would you choose and why to, to own? Oh. All right, what, any, any item from the world of comics, but it's not a Mother Box and not? Yeah, it can't, it can't be like universe altering or right. reality bending. Done yeah. and done. But it could be like fucking the helmet of Naboo. Yeah. Fuck, from Dr. Fate and shit. Absolutely. Then the helmet of Naboo. <laughs> <laughs> from Dr. Fate. Um, no, I, let me see. What would I want from comics? The Iron Man suit. Especially as featured in the movies. Because he can literally step out of it and then step into it and shit. Then I would also want somebody to maintain it. Because I'm not smart like him. <laughs> or mechanical. But the Iron Man suit, you know, uh, or what did he call it? It's not a weapon. It's a... A it's a high-tech prosthesis. Um, that seems like it could do a bunch of fucking shit. I mean, number one, think of all the money you would save on airfare. Like, you just, you're flying everywhere and shit. Um, and then, you know, there's, you could jump into war zones and fucking take out tanks and stuff. Um, and then also, like, remember in, in, in Iron Man 2, he peed in it and it all worked out? <laughs> you could wear it and it would just take care of you and stuff. It's like a giant diaper. <laughs> uh, wow, I'm not sure I can beat the giant diaper. Um, and it can't be universe altering, so like there's no infinity gauntlet. Yeah, no infinity gauntlet. Like none of the stones. You can't have the eye of Agamotto. Can't have the stones. Um, I don't know if I'm imaginative enough for. Can it be a living ring. thing? What's that? Can it be a living thing or tech? It's got to be tech. Like does Lockheed the Dragon? Count? Oh, I was gonna do that. I got, yeah, I guess that would work. Go, yeah. take it, go. I was, no, no, I don't want it, because I feel like it's breaking the rules. <laughs> uh, 
I want, and it's going to sound pervy, but I want Cerebro. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and Cerebro is not world alter altering, it just magnifies the where's. Right. I mean, I suppose I would also need to be Charles Xavier. You need to be a mutant, to, too. To yeah. fucking, so maybe that sucks. Or lucky again. <laughs> so maybe that sucks. <laughs> Should have thought of that before I asked yeah. for some rebro. You got this big thing that's the size of a room that you remember the fucking keys for, man. Um, ooh, no. The danger room. Ooh, yeah. I want the danger room. Not for danger purposes, but <laughs> <laughs> just for like kick ass party purposes. Like, it's, you can show a fucking holodeck. Like, I don't need to actually have robots kill me. Like, we can just have a really good time. Fuck that. We'd be making the cheapest movies in the world, man. Yes. Because I'd be like, today we're going to fight a Transformer, and the fucking danger room makes a Transformer. And we just roll cameras on that shit. It's the danger room is literally the fucking volume they shot the Mandalorian in. Did you see that footage? I saw that wall in real life when Ooh. we were working on the Disney, uh, when we were working on the potential Disney uh, Plus show, Kingdom Keepers. They brought me in for a, like a tech day, and they were like, this wall here can duplicate any fucking background. And um, I have footage on one of my phones of like shooting the wall. When you move from side to side, it moves and creates depth and stuff. So when I saw that behind the scenes on, on Mandalorian thing, I was like, oh my God, they're using that fucking wall. Wow. It's I mean, it's, it's the same... The idea was in Mission Impossible, one of them, where it's that scene where they're walking down a hallway, and so they put up this screen that is Ghost Protocol. Ghost Protocol, well done. Where like it's keyed into the perspective of the dude at the end of it, and so every yes. time he moves, the image moves with him. They just stole that and made a fucking room out of it. Made it for real. Yeah, way to go, guys. That's uh, kind of also like the, not the exact, but the pseudoscience behind Invisible Man, too. Is it? Is yeah, like at one point, they're like, he's brilliant in optics. And I was like, what a cop out that is. But then when they did it, I was like, oh shit, he is brilliant in optics. Is, is, I was just so glad it wasn't like, I fucking create a potion and I drank it and shit. Like, it made sense where I was like, holy fuck, like, that makes sense in a weird sci fi tech way. Okay, I'll buy it. Um, but yes, I want the danger room. You get the danger room, and what did I choose? The Iron Man the suit. Iron Man suit. Yeah. The Iron Man suit. Yeah, I guess that over the Batmobile. Batmobile just does one thing, right? And probably looks wow. like a gas guzzler. Fuck that. <laughs> uh, the Iron Man suit's run by an arc reactor, so there's, it's like free, cheap energy and shit, right? Yeah, Do I get the arc reactor with the suit or just the suit? This ain't one of these like deals with the devil thing where no, he's like, I you didn't say specifically. <laughs> <laughs> Because having a big suit that don't work ain't gonna fucking like do me anything, but it's the whole deal. Oh yeah, the whole deal. It wouldn't Iron work Man suit, man. Yeah. Iron Man suit, and I never would have said that's how good those fucking movies are. Because I never in a million years would have ever picked that in my entire life before those fucking Marvel movies. But now having seen the Iron Man suit work over and over again, and I want the the one that he walks in. I don't want that nanobite shit, like the little fucking psh, where it spreads across you. I liked like uh, remember in. Like, uh, he did it a lot in Iron Man 3, but in a, a Age of Ultron, like when they get to the, to the Strucker's place in the beginning and he steps out of the seat, a suit and he's like, sentry mode, and then it just goes mm -hmm. back. And That's cool. That's the fucking version of the suit yeah. I want. I mean, part of me also wants... Like, the expensive a, version. Yeah. <laughs> the, the classic Nick Fury flying car. Yeah. Like, that would be cool. Well, then why not get the fantastic car at that point? Because Reed Richards built that. Fuck, That's true. fuck Shield, man. You never know who's running Shield, right? Could be <laughs> Hydra Car and shit. But Reed Richards, man, you can count on him. Can you, though? <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> um, how about those answers? They work? Oh, yeah, they work. Fucking A, man. You win. Pick a, give it up for him, man. That was fun. You get uh, either the free tickets to the movies or the final draft. Fucking A, and you get All a right. Nate poster. Give it up for him. He's a winner. Well done. Thank you. Do we have the ticket tickets? I think JC, oh, they're, are they're these there? the tickets? These must be the tickets. Probably. Those are tickets. Those yeah. are the tickets. All right, here we go, man. Last question of the night. Is uh, Cindy? Who is it? Cindy. Everyone give it up for who? Cindy? Cindy? Cindy. Give it up for Cindy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Cindy, that is an amazing shirt. Can we just take a peek real quick? Yeah, of course. Oh, that's Where from? DC? It, I don't know. I think it was actually like a hot topic. Oh, they it's still carry some good stuff. Fucking so I like sneaking. Gorgeous. Them. Right. Is Appreciate it a Jim it. Lee you. rendition of? Yeah. Fuck, that's wow. nice. It's pretty badass. 
Appreciate it. Um, all right, so my question is, this, this is kind of a heavy one. So who is your favorite Batman villain and why? Um, mine's always been Mr. Freeze. People usually go for the Joker because that's like always a straightforward go-to. But when I think of like a favorite villain who I can like relate with, Mr. Freeze has always been like on my top list. I was wondering who you guys would choose as your favorite villain and why. Is your Mr. Freeze predicated on the Batman animated series? That Mr. Freeze? Yeah. That's Paul Dini. And then also, like, Paul Dini helped write the Arkham series. Yes. And in Arkham Knight, they really wrapped that up nicely, and it's a really big, like, arc that he has, and I, I really enjoyed that, so I always thought that was a really good story. So I wonder he, what he you did. guys that's the, that's the difference a brilliant writer can make with, like, a character. Prior right. to him touching Mr. Freeze, Mr. Freeze mm -hmm. was, like, you know, and also ran. You never thought, it was, oh, he wears that helmet and shit. Right. And fucking from the Batman TV show, there was that one episode, remember, where he was sitting in a fucking frozen room and he wanted, like, wh whoever wanted to, like, sit with him had to walk between, like, they had these red lights that would, like, heat the panel so they could come sit next to him and shit. It was all corny. Paul turned it into, like, something beautiful, tragic, heartbreaking. One can relate to the fucking villain at the same time as, like, despise him and stuff. Yeah, that's, he, he fucking, what an artist. Think about, think about how many people now know the character as that character because that guy laid hands on the character. That's transformed it. Um, all right, you want to go first or me? Uh, I'm going to let you close it out. Um, I, I was not a Batman fan. As a, like Batman was not my entree right. into, into comic books. I was a Marvel kid. I was, um, I was an X-Men kid. I was a Spider-Man kid. Um, and then Dark Knight Returns came out, and I was like, oh, shit, I need to pick this up. Like, it was that and Watchmen at the same time. Like, it brought me over to DC. The book Dark Knight Returns, yes. The book yes. Dark Knight Returns um, and Watchmen. Were, Probably converted a lot of people to Batman. It really did. That was, it, it was the entry vector for Batman. Um, and then I got to be a Batman fan. And then I read, um, I want to say it was Son of the Demon, mm. maybe. Um, it was a big, like, fucking hardcover, like... Mike Barr. Mike Barr. Um, and that was my first exposure to Ra's al Ghul. Mm. And, and it was the first time I'd heard Batman referred to as the detective. Yes. You know, he was just a hello detective. He's the detective, of course. And I loved that character. I loved that sort of... The, the, the overly moral but totally skewed version of the world that he had, it was, I want to make it better. Essentially, cinematic Thanos is kind of like Ra's al Ghul. So. Because Thanos in the comics wasn't like, oh, I want to kill half the universe to save it. He was like, I want to do it to impress death, because I love <laughs> death. They're like, death, the lady death. Mm -hmm. So they kind of borrowed more of the noble villain approach of like, uh, I just want to, you know, fucking save the universe by getting rid of half. Somebody has to make the hard decisions. Right. And that was Ra's al Ghul. That was Ra's al Ghul. I mean, I loved his, his desires to, to confound his own humanity. Like, he realized that, like, I, I can't live forever. I want to live forever. Let me solve the forever problem. And here's, like, I, I'd, I just really was taken by, because I, the Batman that I knew before that was very much the, uh, Adam West Batman, mm -hmm. and then the sort of animated series Batman I would come to after that. But it, like so much of it was jokey, so much of it was silly, and the villains were always kind of silly, but that dude was for real, and that dude had an agenda. And he loved Batman in a weird-ass sort of way. Yeah. Like, they were equals. It was very much... He respected the shit out of him. It was Moriarty and Sherlock Holmes. Yes. And, and that's oh, my God, that's all it was. My whole life, I was like, <laughs> what an original relationship. But you're right, it's just Sherlock Holmes right. and Moriarty. You know, and so I love the feeling of coming at Batman from that angle, which had right. never come to me that way. And of course, his arch nemesis in that story would be also on that same plane. And so getting to Batman the detective, getting to that level of, of investment in that character, like right. if only he would agree with him, man, we could do great things. Right, and that's, what, that's why I always liked like the Batman villains when they're so personable and like they're very attached to their goal and how they see the world. Those are always the best villains to me. And I feel like even in a cinematic point of view, they haven't even scratched the surface. Like, you got Man Bat, you have Clayface, Mr. Freeze hasn't been done justice. All these villains, like, haven't even begun to been able to cover, like, how Batman stories can be told from a villain's point of view, which makes them that much better because Batman's the same way they are. He's just on the good, good side of things. Like, right. like he's every Batman, got his own agenda. Yeah, every Batman villain is reflecting a version of either Bruce Wayne or Batman right. back at him. 
and I thought that the, the parallels between the two there were particularly stark for me. Awesome. And I, I, I like that one. I, I, I like the Joker as much as anybody else, but I never understood why, you know, that's the opposite of a bat as a clown. What? Like, it, <laughs> it's great character, but he was not the one that, you know, um, when I think of Batman, I, I don't immediately go to Joker in terms of stuff that I think about, like, ooh, Batman, who's Batman's villain for me? Um, I don't... I honestly don't know, because I was thinking about it while Mark was talking, and it's not even like, oh, he took my answer. I don't know who my favorite bat villain is, and who's the one that means the most to me, or who's the one that I could do the most with if I ever like tried to play with the character. Let me think. Um, well, it's not... Um, I mean, I like the Catwoman character. Poison Ivy is always interesting. I think in when I when I like uh, it's, this is going to be a weak answer, but when I wrote Batman, one of my favorite characters to write him with was Poison Ivy, and not just because like she fucking used THC to knock him out, she got him high and shit, <laughs> um, which I thought was fun. I was like, nobody's done that yet. Easy pickings, <laughs> but just the I I like their interplay. Um, how you know it, it's not just the like she's incredibly sexualized or something like that. She's brilliant. Like she's a, you know, in some ways kind of like Cheetah, like uh, you know Minerva herself, like a scientist who took it too fucking far. Right. Um, depending on which incarnation you do, but I, I don't know. That's not even my faves. Not Catwoman, not Riddler. Although I've read some wonderful Riddler stories. Um, not Penguin, although that would have been the easy go-to back in the day. Harvey Dent is interesting. Yeah. Uh, Two Face, when done well, uh, his, I think the best he's ever been done was probably by Frank Miller in Dark Knight Returns, because that's what got me interested in in Harvey Dent as a mm -hmm. character, reading that book and being like, "What the fuck?" Like right. just the notion that, and it was a wonderful twisted notion that Frank Miller played with, that he was fixed, mm -hmm. that all of the damage was gone, and he looked normal if not beautiful, but he like there's that beautiful panel switch where he's like talking to Batman and going like it's a mockery it's a joke and blah 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 and all these things and Batman's internal is like I finally see him the way he is and he goes from the same shot of him looking like a normal human being to him being blown out like in his head Harvey Dent will all, even if they repair him he's so fucking deeply scarred that he is two-faced forever I thought that was a really compelling notion um, I like that character a bunch. I never really fucked with him, though, whenever I did comics. Um, but maybe it might be Harvey Dent, might be Two-Face. Especially because there's this bittersweet nature to their relationship. They work together. Right. Like, they were both on the side of justice. And also there's a bit of, like, I mean, he's kind of gone off the deep end and he becomes a, a, a criminal and stuff. But here's a, it's an example of a guy who knows the system as well and has just realized that, like, the system's fucked in the very similar way that Batman has realized that the system is fucked and right. goes about it as I, I always I always thought of Harvey as like a B-list Batman like he didn't have the same money but he still had that duality and especially that line they have in Dark Knight when he says uh, he says to him oh I hear they have a different name for me in the MCU he's like oh I don't know what that would be but they call him already Harvey Two-Face Two -Face, yeah. like they already call him that so I always liked that like he always had that duality until it and they actually, did a really, I mean, right. Chris Nolan, it goes without saying, did a like, right, brilliant right. rendition of that character. And uh, Aaron Eckhart was wonderful playing the role. But, you know, there weren't many times they fucked with that character in media beyond the page. Right. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones did him in a very over-the-top fashion. But then, of course, what's his name? Richard Mall is probably the most famous one and the most touching one from the Batman the Animated Series. Like that initial first arc that took Harvey Dent into like Two Face right. territory, where the he's like, were big. This is such a great fucking two parter. Right. Um, but I, I think Aaron Eckhart like elevated it, as did Chris Nolan. And, and uh, did he write that by himself, or was he? Uh, his brother helped. And, and what's his name? And, and, and David Goyer. Goyer. Their take on the character I thought was really great and tragic and wonderful. Right. I got one more thought. Yeah, go. Joe Chill. Ooh, mm. the ultimate Batman villain. Yeah. Without, the villain without whom there is no Batman whatsoever. And the one he'll never catch. 
the one he'll never put in Arkham, the one he'll never stop from doing anything else because he's done everything he could possibly do. Mm. We need a movie like that. Mm. Get away from the Jokers. Yeah, what a yeah. satisfying movie that would be. Like, Joker was good, I, didn't, let's... If I didn't fucking solve the crime yeah. or get the killer credits. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the good enough that. answer? Yeah, awesome. Fucking Thank give it you. up for him. It's a great question, it. ladies and gentlemen. You win the tickets and the poster. Goddamn pleasure, man. Um, that was fun. I forgot how fun it is to kind of do the what ifs and shit like that. Yeah. Fall down a rabbit hole. Um, oh my God. Uh, like uh, this world in about three weeks when the coronavirus kills us all, the show is at an end, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, have you enjoyed yourself this week? Did you have a good time? So lovely to be back. Thanks for everyone who came out to be with us here tonight, man. Uh, but of course, big thanks to the guy standing next to me who not only held down the fort and stuff while I was away, uh, but has even improved at his job since I've begun. You're fucking sharp, man. Give it up for the fabulous Mr. Mark Bernardin. Or should I say, Picard's Mark huh? Bernardin. <laughs> Uh, we are doing this again when? It's not next week, but it's the 24th. 24th, so if you want to get tickets for it, uh, they'll, I'm sure they're online right now. Uh, if you're in the Los Angeles area, today is what? Tuesday, Wednesday? Mm -hmm. Tuesday. Tuesday. On Friday, I'm uh, in Hollywood on Melrose at the Shag store mm -hmm. doing a signing of the print that he did, the Jay and Silent Bob print. We did a, a signing down at the Palm Springs store a couple months ago. Now we're doing it here in town. Y'all are welcome to come and stuff. Even if you don't buy anything, come hang out. The store is fucking beautiful and shit. But I guarantee you, it's tough to walk out of that place without buying something. His artwork is really nice. Um, and the print he did for Jane Silent Bob is breathtaking. So I'm doing that on fucking Friday. Mark's series is already sold out. It's already sold out, but we'll have another one in May. And look for that. Uh, and then I think Hollywood Babylon I'm getting back to at the end of this month in Oxnard. So if you're into that, check out tickets at csmod.com. Uh, um, as always, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the greatest watering hole on the planet, man. Scum and Villainy Cantina. JC runs a hell of a shop here. Give it up for fucking JC. And thank all of you at home and stuff who've been patiently waiting while I was off on tour. I'm back now, so we'll be doing this much more regularly. And there's so much fucking news to cover all the time. It's happening so fucking fast. Can't wait to cover it all with you. Uh, I looked forward to coming here while I was on tour. I was like, once well, tour is going to suck, when it's all over, it's going to suck. But I knew I'd come here, and I get to do a variation of the same shit I was doing there the whole time. So it's almost like coming home. Thank you for giving me a home. Uh, to come home to, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that being said, uh, fuck, I forget how we finished the fucking show. It's been so long. Um, I say, we'll give it up for Mark Bernardin. And that's it for Fat Man Beyond, ladies and gentlemen. Tune in next time. Same fat time. Same fat channel. No, you don't. Smartcast.com or? YouTube.com slash Kevin Smith. For the good of all, Creed. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah.